Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular City Commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, August 16th, 2022 at 4 p.m. We're a couple minutes late on this one as well. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Bolston. Here. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. Here. And please stand for the pledge. Okay, we are at agenda approval. Any additions, deletions, or substitutions? Yes. Yes. No yes? I do. Oh, I do. Okay. Uh, six point uh, six dot C. Six C. Yeah. All right. You want to move that to a item to speak about? Yes. Seven A A. Discussion. Discussion. Yes. Okay. We'll move it to seven A A. I, ha I have one. Yes. So, can we just move six F for discussion? I just need to explain one thing to you. Sure. That'll be 7BB. Anything else? Seeing 6F? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Um, entertain a motion. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Yes. Walston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. All right, moving on down to what I think most everybody is here for is resolution number 118-22. Mayor, Commissioners, Dwayne DeAndre, Human Resources Department, privileged to be in front of you here today. Very special evening here yes, this evening. Uh, we have a resolution honoring Police Chief Javaro Sims for 30 years of service here at the Delray Beach Police Department. Mm -hmm. And I know, Mayor, you have the resolution that you'd like to read into the and record. I will read it into the record. A resolution of the City of the Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, recognizing and commending Javaro Sims for 30 years of service with the city of Delray Beach. Whereas Javaro Sims began his career at the city of Delray Beach on September 28, 1992, and has achieved nearly 30 years of dedicated service with the city as he approaches his retirement on August 30th, 2022. You're going to be missed. Whereas Javaro Sims has re, uh, hired as a police officer in 1992, promoted to sergeant in 1997, to lieutenant in 2003, to captain in 2008, to assistant chief in 2014, and named police chief on April 6, 2019, where he has served with honor and distinction. And whereas Javaro's personnel file is filled with dozens of letters of appreciation and commendation from citizens and other law enforcement agencies for his compassion, dedication, and professionalism. And whereas Javaro has demonstrated his commitment to unity by establishing the motto of quote, one Del Rey, one community, one police department, end quote. He leads by example, fostering positive working relationships through trust, teamwork, and engagement. And whereas as president of Palm Beach County Association Chiefs of Police, Javaro has displayed outstanding leadership in the field of law enforcement and is well respected by his peers. He is also approachable and treats everyone with dignity and respect. And whereas Javaro ensures the police department is at the forefront of designing and implementing best practices in law enforcement. He is a pillar in, our, in the Delray Beach community and is continuously developing innovative engagement strategies to further strengthen community relationships, accountability, and engagement. And whereas in the city of Delray Beach has benefited from Javaro's vision and his willingness to make the difficult choices. The impact he has had on people's lives will be felt for generations. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, as follows. Section 1, that the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach hereby recognizes and commends Javaro Sims for nearly 30 years of dedicated and faithful public service Section 2, that the City Commission hereby congratulates and expresses sincere thanks and appreciation to Javaro Sims for his many years of service and wishes him the very best of health and happiness in his retirement. Thank you so much.
Well, first, let me say thank you all to the commission, mayor, and especially you, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're surprised. You've been a tremendous help to me uh, over my tenure as chief of police, so I truly appreciate that. But, um, but first, let me recognize my wife of over 30 years, Karen, for. <laughs> and, with, and without her, this would have been extremely difficult. Now, I look back on 1992, uh, you can't see this day <laughs> almost 30 years ago. And now we're here. Yeah. And I can tell you, I'm proud of everything that we have accomplished here in the city of Delray Beach, not just for me, but also for the city and also for the employees. And I can tell you, I've had some wonderful employees uh, uh, over the 30 years that I've been in the agencies, uh, a lot of mentors. So I truly uh, appreciate that. You know, law enforcement. Fortunately, unfortunately, under the circumstances, you know, I was chief under some of the most difficult times for law enforcement with the social unrest, the pandemic, um, the, the, the defunding law enforcement. We went through some trying times, but we pulled together as a community, and that's where one Delray, one community, one police department comes into play. We came together as one community, and we worked through all the issues that we was facing at that time together. And that's what it takes, us together, making a difference together. We cannot stand alone. I cannot, cannot stand alone. Uh, Russ Major would be the incoming chief, and I guarantee you he would do a tremendous job. He does understand that it takes a village. And a village means not just police department, the business districts, the residents, the government. It takes all of us collectively to truly have a, I guess, impact a positive impact on our community. So with that being said, I'm going to say the long speech for the change of commands <laughs> on the 30th <laughs> at Atlanta High School. But I truly appreciate you supporting me as your chief of police and it's here in the city of Delray Beach. And I can tell you, it's been a wonderful, positive experience. So thank you very much. So, Mayor and Commission, I'm going to present uh, Chief Sims with the plaque for 30 years of service and also a, uh, um, the copy of the resolution that you read into the record, Mayor. Yes. And I'll have him come up to the front so he can get pictures in front of you and the Commission. Fantastic. Perfect. And by the way, I've already lost 10 pounds. <laughs> Chief, would you like to race? Yeah. <laughs> Does he get eight hours off? <laughs> hey, hey, yes, <laughs> The big question is, does he get a car to take him? Oh. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Well, that was great. All right. If anybody came just here for the chief, you are more than welcome to, um, you don't have to stay. <laughs> You're welcome to stay, but you don't have to. Now, we have, an, we have another presentation of the Parks and Recreation and Public Works with the, um, wait, Parks and Recreation and Public Works uh, employ, uh, Teams of the Month. Yes, Ms. Lachey. <laughs> Madam Mayor Lachey King, Human Resources Generalist. So normally we give an award for our Employee of the Month. Right. But this time we receive two nominations, not for an employee, but for teams that, you know, they got together and they accomplished a common goal. And that's one of the major reasons we give this award. So we are going to start with our Parks and Recreation Department. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can read the names into record Absolutely. and then we can, okay. So those team members are Director Sammy Todd, Assistant Director Amy Hansen, Prentiss Mobley, Dexter Hazel, Dan Krasinski, Danny Oliveira, Nelson Palomo, Priscilla Patrick, Danielle Pearson, 
Marisa Rodriguez, <laughs> Munala Sahai, Synovian Stevens, Linda Wheeland, Danielle Beardsley, and Juan Vasquez. You can come on up. And Commissioner Cassell, are you going to speak? Oh, thank you so much. I, so I nominated the team, well, for a lot of reasons. I know, I don't know if this is customary, but if it isn't, I'm so, I was going to say, I didn't know we could nominate a team. <laughs> well, I, we can now. And I really, it's... Set, yeah, the precedent has been I set. did it. I started it. Um, you know, what's really unfortunate about being a city commissioner is you don't get to interact with all the employees. But every time I have the opportunity to interact with some of our employees, I feel we're so fortunate. You know, the thing that is very obvious sitting up here is we can't get anything done in the city without everybody that works in the city and the hard work. Um, but I always, I, when I see Parks and Rec, I'm just in awe. You know, the Christmas tree, the parade, the 4th of July events, the movie night, three back-to-back -back Easter egg hunts. But one of the most impressive things was the mayor and I were sitting at a ceremony over at Pompeii Park one day, and we were getting texts and phone calls from individuals who had believed that they had scheduled the field house, when in fact they did not. And so here we are. They can't get in the field house. They hadn't even scheduled it. Our team, with a smile, pulled it together in a moment's notice. I, you had the opportunity to turn them down and say, no, sorry, you didn't schedule. But instead, you all pulled together and provided for them. And I just absolutely love the can-do attitude of this team under you, Sam Mitot. And I know part of that is your leadership. And just quick, Prentice Mobley, I don't know if he wasn't here last week. Yes, that food drive was amazing. Start to finish, you organize that 6 a.m. start unloading, getting things sorted. And then I think it was 800 different boxes distributed. You're amazing. Marissa, I love your kids. <laughs> you are a great mom. It is hard to balance a job like yours where you're working all these strange hours. Every time I see your kids, I'm remarkably impressed. And the same goes for Danielle. I love your children. <laughs> and Prentice, your kids too. I visited camp the last day. The camp was amazing. The kids were so happy. I, I don't know how you two balance your job and parenting, but you're doing such a great job. Priscilla, always with a smile, and you recognize everybody, which is amazing because I can <laughs> never, ever remember names. And then Nan, I, I don't know where you are not, but you're everywhere. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night, I see you at events, doing things, working hard. I totally appreciate you. And Danielle, I saw Danielle at the 4th of July event. A man was running, trying to get to work in time, and he clearly did not realize the road was going to be close, and he was struggling. She stopped, she picked him up, she gave him a ride. Above and beyond is a totally appropriate a name for the ward you guys should get tonight. Um, and anybody that I didn't specifically individually recognize, I'm sorry. I'm sure I've observed you do something super wonderful. And Juan, especially you, because you're not even part of the Parks and Rec team. <laughs> you ended up helping out. So really, guys, I love your can-do attitude. You represent this city so well, and we are so fortunate to have you. Thank you. And so I just wanted to make sure everybody knows that I gave her her speech. <laughs> <laughs> you did a great job, uh, Julie. So on behalf of the mayor and the commission, we have these wonderful certificates oh. that you're walking away from. We can <laughs> pass them out. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. There you go. You get one too. Come on in, guys. One for you. Okay. I think I think that's. <laughs> we 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 have enough because I have one more. I have one more. Yeah. Is that everybody?
That's right. You're welcome. You know, I was going <laughs> to... Uh, and Shay, yes. I was just going to say one thing. I yes. mean, I, I have to tell you, there is uh, this team has made us look good in so many different ways, and I know that Commissioner Casal hit on most of those. But you also stepped in in a situation where we kind of lost momentum at yeah. the at the old school square uh, grounds, and this is the crew that has been doing all of the concerts and everything yes. else that's been going on. There too. Yes. So thank you guys for everything that you do. You make us look great. And uh, we, we are so proud of what you've done. Thank you. Thank you. Go right ahead, Lachey. All righty. And so we have another team that we would want to recognize this evening. And that is our Public Works Department. Mm -hmm. And here to speak on their half is Lieutenant Debray. Good afternoon, everyone. Michael DeBray from the police department. I'd like to um, welcome up John, Dennis, and Juan. Please come up here again. Thank you. Um, above and beyond is an understatement of what these gentlemen did. We recently upgraded the police department to a real-time crime center. We subcontracted this job out to a third party which the job did not get completed. There were um, delays in it. These three gentlemen stepped up to the plate and completed the job early, under budget, and saved the city lots of money. So I'd like to thank them for uh, coming together as a team. And you guys recently res solved a very old um, crime, I think something was in the back times, I think. I, that, that's Cold case. Cold case, I'm sorry, yes. It's correct. It was yeah. a homicide right. from the 80s. Right. 1883. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, important Thank to you. have. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. So, on behalf of the Mayor and Commission, we would like to present to you a plaque and don't tell the others. You give me your plaque. I was going to say, this is going to create a problem. You get a plaque and one, one, one more. One. one more. And a picture. Step right up. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, wow. Here you go. Congratulations. Oh, wow. So you have here. I'll give you one, too. I'll give you one. So you, get right one. you can. Oh, we'll see you next month when you get another one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> find a way to sl slip in. Mayor? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. We appreciate that. That was fun. All right. So moving on to um, our, s our agenda item number five, comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items. We're going to start off with um, city manager's response to any prior public comments or inquiries. Any? I do have one briefly, sure. and that is in relationship to information having been circulated during the last few days coming from the Airbnb advertisements. Oh, yes. Some commentary relative to Derry Beach being a profitable opportunity regarding long term rentals. And of course, as we previously reported, the Department of Neighborhood and Community Services is currently working collaboratively with the Office of the City Attorney to develop modified ordinance provisions to help address that, but more cogently, there's also direction underway in the Department of Neighborhood and Community Services for the upcoming fiscal year to include resources f to secure the services of a vendor specializing in tracking and reporting vacation rentals so that we can do a much more proactive job of enforcement and resolving any issues and concerns in that regard. So of course, long-term rentals are appropriate and legal in this regard, and that was the angle, respectively, however, it does raise the concern regarding the number of activities associated with that type of use. So with that, there's a couple steps being executed to get to that place, and likewise, more information to be forthcoming. In addition to that, um, if I may, I just wanted to ask, um, anybody who's renting any homes in our city has to register to rent, correct? We have to have registration. So this is uh, low-hanging fruit. Uh, I'm sure that uh, when I saw that we were, what, number two? two. Yeah, number two in the nation. On a long-term basis. They Is it emphasize. state or nation? 
I, it might have been state. I'm not sure. I was, yeah. yeah. Regardless, we are way up there, and I just have a funny feeling that we're not getting anywhere near the number of homes that are being rented out um, uh, having to register. Which is why I offered, the, I feel the same way, Madam Mayor and ladies and gentlemen, which is why I thought I'd be appropriate to mention efforts being executed. So again, a vendor specializing in the tracking and reporting of rentals to that effect will help us do a much more proactive job in terms of enforcement. Yes, Vice Mayor. Just to, just to be clear, we're two in the nation. Okay, so it was nation. Yeah. It was the nation. Uh, this is an article, August 12th, right. 2022. I actually, uh, I, Shirley and I spoke about it when we were down at the uh, Florida League of Cities. Mm -hmm. We are, uh, La Quinta's number one, we're two, Marco Island, three, Palm Springs, four, and Indio, California, five. So did you see the article? And, that, and that's the hosts, so in other words, the rentals. Yeah. Correct. So this is why we're proceeding as we are. I just Very wish good. to bring you all up to speed, so and thank you. Just so we are clear, in 2010, 11, 12, we passed an ordinance that you are limited on the amount of times you can rent out your home. So there's an ordinance on the book. I don't know if Lynn's looked at it. I think I she have, has. Okay. Cool. Times. So, Unfortunately, um, there was a preemption that came down from the state, and so we changed our ordinance. Like I'm echoing. We changed our ordinance after, and so we're stuck with what was before the preemption, which is not the strong one that you're familiar with. We're working on it. We have found ways that we can mitigate the impacts of the, of the rentals that can help us enforce it. Unfortunately, the turnover is still going to be limited, but the impacts will be able to regulate. Okay. Thank you. You'll, you'll be seeing that shortly. Thank you. Okay, so somebody either has something on um, and we're hearing a feedback. If somebody's watching, um, the, has it on their computer, computer potentially? Because it's, 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 well, no, because I'm hearing a, a feedback. I hear something too. Like it's a second person. It's out there someplace. You hear it out there. Okay. Anyway, if you can just turn it down, that would be great. Um, all right. Moving on to um, the uh, 5A1, which is the follow-up uh, clarity and direction concerning summer camps, Pompey Buck. Yes, ma'am. So briefly, Director of Parks and Recreation, Sam Mita, we made a commitment to offer clarification relative to summer camp relationships, Palm Beach County, otherwise, as they pertain to programs at the Pompey Park. So Mr. Mita, if you would, please. Yes, uh, Sam Mita, Parks and Recreation Director. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I have Superintendent of Recreation, Prentice Mobley, who will be carrying us through the presentation. Um, and it's a quick overview of um, some of the, most of the pros, but even some of the obstacles that we do have with our summer camp program. Just a nice overview of what that program is and um, what it's all about over there at Pompey Park. Mr. Mobley? Right on, right on. Good, afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Hello. Um, I'm going to uh, go through a brief presentation here, just uh, information about our summer camp out of school, um, which has been we've we've been having for multiple two of years uh, ever since I was young. So it's it's, it's a staple. Um, we we'll go to the next slide. You ready for? Where is it? Right here. Yes. Okay. Okay. The big button. All right. Uh, our out of school and uh, summer camp, we have a partnership with the uh, ELC, the Early Learning Coalition of Palm Beach County, which offer financial assistance for the cost of child care to eligible working parents. Uh, services are very, very based on individual needs and range from extended care to out of school, days out of school and summer camp, both fun and educational opportunities provided by these settings. So really the ELC is basically a way that we can uh, offer summer camp and they can provide funding for those uh, kids who, uh, or those families, I'm sorry, that uh, couldn't afford the fees. And they offset that and they pay us back uh, the difference. Um, Early Learning Coalition of Palm Beach County, they partner with Primetime, which is under their umbrella. And uh, they're a nonprofit organization that provides resources and support to after school time um, that come in and uh, offer programs to our youth, to our kids, through athletics, arts and crafts, life skills, exercise, drug abuse prevention healthy cooking, animals and wildlife, bullying awareness, and STEM programming. Some of the benefits of our ELC uh, partnership is to reimburse what I mentioned earlier, reimbursement to the city, youth participants, and after school and summer camp programs, uh, reduce program <laughs> rates for those families, uh, also offer staff uh, free trainings for the 45 hours child care certificate that they need to be out of school counselors uh, which is uh, 
demanded by the Florida Health Department, uh, which licenses our areas, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, program staff receive additional free continued child care education opportunities, free instructional arts and academic programs, and field trips that provide hands-on opportunities for the participants in the program. These are kind of some of our numbers uh, lately. I just went from, we just went from 2019. Uh, 2019, we, we did have two sites at that time that was pre-COVID. Uh, as you can see, uh, 62 Community Center, uh, 69 Pompey Park. Um, majority of those people are residents. Uh, 2020, we didn't have out of school, but we did do a camp. Uh, we had about 45 kids there. And in 2021 and 2022, you can see 82 and 86 um, participants throughout that year, that term. The location right now, our uh, summer camp. And out of school runs out of Pompey Park. So uh, the camp and out of school are currently held at Pompey Park. The gymnasium is licensed through the health department um, and ELC throughout the uh, school and camp hours. So that's 2 to 6 during the school year and 7.30 to 5.30 during the summer. Uh, the health department is, uh, is the license that prevents uh, outsiders from going in, more of a safety approach. They do inspections. Sometimes they pop up. Sometimes we know. Uh, and then we're, we're basically on the pass and fail notice for that. So, um, the three-way room during camp, uh, the gymnasium is the only part that is licensed. So the three-way room is used for the Pompey Park Senior Club that we have. Also for out-of-school field trips. Basically, we call it out-of-school field trips because the gymnasium is their license area. So when they leave that license area, it's called a field trip. So even if they're walking down the hall to the three-way room, it's a field trip. Hold on, let me go back. Uh, also, we use May Volan Senior Meals out of that room. Lunch and breakfast during summer camp is also out of there. Uh, the two-way rooms are used for the seniors uh, as well, and uh, some of the spillover you from uh, throughout the day until 6 p.m. Uh, the community center gymnasium is also licensed by the health department currently during that time as a backup site. Um, so if there's, um, being that we're a licensed program, if there's any issues with Pompey Park, and we have to move the kids, for instance, the gym getting repaired and they have to be out of the gym for two weeks, they can only move to another site that's licensed. So that's why the community center is a backup site, which we just learned uh, recently. Uh, we wasn't really programming out of the community center, but we learned recently that we could, uh, being that the kids are not housed there, that it's a backup site that we can uh, start to run some programming out of the community center. Uh, these are some of the fees, uh, neighboring cities and agencies uh, for summer camp. Uh, as you see, uh, some of the neighboring cities, you got Boynton up there, 575 for residents, 715 for non-residents. Uh, Boca Raton, you see that number there. They go by the weekly price, but that's how it would be for the monthly. 3000 for the residents, 379 for non-residents. Uh, and we are at 595 for 545, I'm sorry, for residents, and 550 for non-residents. And we provide the ELC scholarship, which will, you know, some of those kids, you know, won't pay that fee based on their economic situation. They may pay very cost. Okay. Uh, same thing for out of school. Boynton and Boca, they, they currently don't have a set out of school program, but our out of school program is 575 for residents, 675 for non residents, and also we offer that ELC scholarship to some of those kids. Boca is a licensed child care. Uh, Boynton is currently working toward. Uh, renewing their license. Uh, last slide is some of the challenges that we have. Uh, like I said, um, throughout the years, the, um, the child care industry or the child care way has, has took peaks and valleys. So uh, a lot of the challenges that we face that we try to daily overcome and, you know, shoot at staffing, of course, uh, getting proper staff, turnover on staff, uh, and then making sure that those staff are prepared and licensed I mean, uh, certified to work with kids. So uh, it's a lot of trial and error. You know, I'm, I'm quite sure a lot of corporations, a lot of areas are dealing with the staffing. Uh, take um, enrollment. Oh, another thing back with the staffing, because it's tied to enrollment. So we have to have the proper staff to take on the proper amount of kids. So we can't take 70 kids if we don't have the proper staff to be able to deal with that amount of youth. Um, like I said, the nonprofits and the social, that's just like, you know, over the years, there's been a difference. There have been emergence of other groups. You know, you have achievement centers. You have the Boys and Girls Club. You have Milagro. You have um, other groups that, that deal with child care or after school care or summer camps. So within that, 
you know, it's a constant competition between those, you know, not a mean competition, but a competition to be able to grab some of those kids and say, hey, you guys come here instead of going there type of deal. So I listed it as a challenge because that's something that, you know, you just you want to compete and you want to get the kids in. You want to provide the best atmosphere for them. So uh, it's an every year thing. And then the social aspect uh, that we also know uh, being that, um, you know, the times that we're in coming out of a pandemic, uh, also with inflation and different people, mental state. It's just a lot of social cogs that go up and down that we deal with within Parks and Rec all together, not just with out of school or summer camp. And then programming during the hours. So uh, being that the gym, NASM is uh, it's licensed. It's a challenge trying to find those other areas for the kids that might not be in summer camp, which really are like the preteens. So maybe like your 12 year olds or your 13 year olds who've aged out of that group or even some of the younger ones. So coming up and shooting the stick at different, you know, different programs that may engage them at that facility. Uh, you know, in times we have done, you know, we've done, we tried ping pong, we tried chess, we've tried, you know, little mental groups, we tried uh, teen councils and different things to try to keep them engaged. But along with that, it's a constant thing. It's a constant way being creative, trying to get something that stick uh, with them. Um, and that's mostly, I would say, mostly for the preteens, you know, the ones that just got out of elementary school. Because the elementary school is mostly when they get off the bus, you know, they're not really more so hanging around. They kind of go home and, uh, you know, come back later for our programming that we have in the afternoon, which is large uh, programming such as, you know, the track, the dance, the rocks, and et cetera. Um, so, yeah, that just, that just concludes, you know, that's just a brief overview of uh, what we have going on with the summer camp and the out of school. Great. Thank you so much, Prentice. Let me ask a couple of questions. I wanted to ask you can, okay. Sam. You yeah, can. we have the team here, so we, yeah. we're open to some questions. So, just real quickly, um, how many kids are you um, ha ha having for your camp now? How many kids in the summer? Some we can take a, we can take a maximum of one fifty, uh -huh. but uh, this summer we had close to eighty. It's eighty. Okay. Yeah. And um, do you, you so you don't have a waiting list? We had a waiting list. Yes. Yes. All right. And um, do we know how many kids are coming from Delray versus other areas? Yeah, they're mostly residents. Uh, most of the majority of our kids are residents that attend uh, our camp. The reason I ask that is because it seems like it's uh, it's so in insignificant. I don't know who came up with the 545 versus the 550, a right. five dollar increase. Um, you know, for the difference between um, somebody that's living in city and somebody who's not. Um, if you look at just the non-residential rate uh, at 715 of Boynton, it's it seems like it's more reasonable. Right. Because, um, you know, when you have only a $5 difference, I would imagine that there are probably kids that are coming from other areas that are squeezing out our own kids if they didn't get it there in there in time. That would be my thought process. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that needs to really be looked at um, because it just doesn't seem like, I mean, why bother? You know, I, $5, I why bother? I agree. So anyway, um, anyone else? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm going to come at this situation in a different, from a different um, perspective. I'm very concerned that we have two of our facilities tied up with 86, that's what your slide said, mm -hmm. 86 children. What about all of the rest of the children in the city who don't have anywhere to go? Well, um, when I'm I was sure giving the there are hundreds. I don't know the number. Okay. If we did a survey, I'm sure there are hundreds. Okay. So, uh, Let's just start at one site at Pompey Park. Um, the gym is the part that is licensed. So it's our, it's our job, our task, uh, to try to program those other areas of the facility. Like I said, the two-way room is probably that main part because the three-way room usually um, we don't usually program out of there. The community center is what we just realized that we are able to because we're not housing the kids. The community center is a backup site. But we wanted the impression that we couldn't because of the license, we were holding them to the same, uh, the same standard as if kids were there. Okay, let me stop you right there. You've brought in, or the city has brought into the licensing by these organizations. Are we not capable of having our own programs if they don't want to cooperate with us due to their licensing requirements? Are we not, when I was a little girl, anybody could come into the, into the gym, or into the facility. Now we have restricted, as you just said, you were under the impression that two had to be, but even with one, Pompey Park is, used to be the gathering place for all the kids. 
You didn't have to be in a program, quote unquote. And I can understand that we might need additional funding from the parents to help. Nobody is going to have a free ride. But with the thought of having the children in a particular place where they might get a meal, where they might not at home, they're being supervised. I don't see how we can tie up even one facility because we are licensed under a certain program that excludes the other children from entering the gymnasium or the facility itself. Okay, right quick, the yeah. license is for the health department, but well, go ahead. Yeah, um, as Mr. Moldy said, it's from the department and that's part of the oversight of the program. But we kind of talked about this a, a couple weeks ago, but one of the challenges just in today's world of aftercare and child care is even if the licensing was not com a component of this, when you run the camp component or an after care, care component you would not allow you still wouldn't allow the other outside groups to come in because there's still an oversight a supervision responsibility and safety that you would want to provide to those children from a protection standpoint. however if you had a program where children who are eligible could register the city is running the program why do we need to have the exclusivity of a certain number I, I think, is, if I if I may I, I think that it, it is evolved to this point, so what we used to experience as children no longer is, and it's basically because of litigation over the years and keeping the children that are coming in safe. So even if we were to run a program, we would have probably have to run the program very much similar to this, or we could find ourselves in the crosshairs of the same Understood. situation. Yeah. Understood, but mm -hmm. would it, wouldn't it be nice if we could include more children is my concern. I, I don't, s 86 students, and you say you're poaching from other programs, there are enough children who are not given the opportunity to be a part of a summer program okay. that the city might just, rather than poaching, go out into the city and find the kids who might not be able to afford it with scholarships or whatever. I just think that we are not serving our city as a whole with the youth especially those 12-year-olds that Mr. Prentice talked about, they're not in the program. Right. What do they do? Stand outside until 5 o'clock when the program is over and then they can come in? So I think, high that, I think you've made your point, and I think that it's not something that we're going to solve here, but exactly. I think that we've made the point to you, and I think that it's a legitimate one. Um, things have changed in all aspects to close down a gymnasium all summer long to all the local kids that are not in the program is not, I think, a, a great idea for 86 kids you know I think that we have to start thinking about what are we going to do in order to be able to work with this and I know that the new the new Pompeii Park which isn't going to be here right away but it took that into consideration so that we will have the gym available and there's a separate area for the kids that are in the program so but until then I think that there should be some sort of a some flexibility maybe in the next couple of years that allow for uh, both and I and I it might be that we shift over the kids in the program to um, the community center or Catherine Strong or somewhere else and then allow that because that is a Pompey Park is a central place for the a very large community of kids to be able to come in and and participate so it's just something to definitely consider now's the time As we'll start planning for change. next summer the best we can you got it you got it i think it's just very important because we don't even know how many children would participate because they've been shut down so long uh, they can't enter the building i mean it's hot their homes might not be properly air conditioned it's a retreat so i think it's a shame that we've done that to our students and i'm children rather and I hope that we can rectify it especially the 12 year olds who are at that stage where they're about to look for good trouble bad trouble and uh, we can maybe divert them back into the right path so thank you very, very much very good any anyone else for comments questions stuff thank, thank you, you so much thank keep you. it up keep up the good work <coughs> all right moving on to 5 um, a2 which is the completion of the Crest Theater building and I believe it's Missy Barletto I'd like to start Madam Mayor Mr. Moore yep so I actually committed to this effect via the July 22nd, 2022 report to you all. That direction has in fact been offered to initiate the completion of the Crest Theater Building Renovation Program for all the right reasons what we talked about previously. And the basis of presentation this evening is to talk a little bit about what's happening technically and to give an overall time frame in terms of what can be expected. Direction to this effect also does contemplate supporting or securing 
outside assistance from folks in the artistic community or experts in the artistic community who are in the area that may collaborate with us in terms of ancillary advice relative to egress and egress and other details as we proceed in the coming weeks. So with that, my interest as is the case of the department director, Missy Barletto and staff working with this project is to frankly secure you all support yes. so that we can proceed accordingly because there are a number of moving parts, but it is exciting over the next few months to get this accomplished with the right mix of professionals to help us to get there. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. Um, as you know, these are the current conditions inside the Crest Theater at the Old School Square campus. The construction project that had been undertaken by the previous tenant was, was stopped before it was completed and the city will be coming back in and picking up where they left off and returning the, the Crest Theater to a usable condition. So these slides just show you a few of the current conditions in the room above that on the left hand side. That room was um, designated to be a commercial kitchen and a teaching um, a place to, to give cooking lessons for chefs in the in the area. The plan is to return it to to the condition that was planned by the former tenant. So currently what we have done in this year's budget, we've identified funding within the Public Works Department budget in order to go through our continuing services engineering contracts and secure an owner's representative to um, be the construction engineering and inspection during the construction project to assist the Public Works Department with ensuring that the plan set that, that we develop for this project is accurate and complete and to help us move forward with the contractor. Um, so they will review the scope and fee that's presented to us from the eventual contractor, assist with negotiations with that firm, and uh, provide the construction oversight. So in the budget for next year is proposed the construction budget to complete the construction inside the Crest Theater. Um, this is we're anticipating being able to complete this through job order contracting, which we've used in several instances on projects with the city recently, one of them being the Northeast 3rd Street streetscape where we, we redid the um, plans that we had for that area and um, updated them. And then that same construction firm carried it through construction. We would do the same thing in this particular instance where the contractor would work with an engineering and architectural firm to update the plans to um, obtain the appropriate building permits and then move forward all the way through construction. Um, Okay, so the proposed schedule for this is that ongoing, we're starting the, the contract negotiations. We've taken several of the firms through the um, Gordian Group that is a part of the source well indefinite quantities um, contract that is, is contracted by the state. It's a more or less a commodities group um, where the the prices are predetermined through negotiation. Um, we have started um, taking those contractors through the process and are waiting on a return of scope and pricing from them so that we'll be able to bring a construction agreement back to commission in November and be able to um, start construction almost immediately after the beginning of the fiscal year in fiscal year 23 with the construction completion um, scheduled for August of 2023 about a year from now so there are some things that are unknowns to us even at this time 
what the new permit timeline is going to look like um, and the lead time for getting specialty equipment say for the the kitchen the lighting and some of the other materials that are called for in the current plans and that is the conclusion of what I have brought for you this evening this is where we are in the process and we anticipate bringing more information to you in the near future anything else so again we appreciate you all support because this is necessary in order to reactivate activity at the old school square campus overall the consensus coming from professionals who are in the artistic community in that particular realm is this is the centerpiece of the overall operation i think you all understand that so in addition to the technical approach that missy was able to outline working with the office of the city manager the budget process etc we will likewise entertain considerations or thoughts that members of the artistic community may have in the area to to also incorporate that into the mix as well likewise my interest is to secure you all support this evening otherwise we are prepared to move forward so thank you um, any chance that we can put this on a faster pace because this is a renovation it is not like building a, a building and we're looking at a year out to me building a building would take a year but renovations I mean and supposedly as far along as the previous tenant was supposed to have gotten which I doubt they did but I know that there weren't like at zero so I don't know why it would take a full year and it takes 90 days to get to the point where, I don't, I don't see your schedule, but it was like November before you're actually even coming back to us with a proposal? Yeah, sorry. So we feel like we'll, we will definitely have the construction agreement ready for commission by that time. By that time, we will have, have the scope narrowed down. It's very difficult for the con construction companies to come in and look at a renovation that is partially completed with the conditions that are shown there and know exactly what's been touched, what hasn't been touched, and that sort of thing. So it's taking them time to really look at what is in there and what isn't in there. There's a, a places inside the theater where there's exposed wiring that's been disconnected and and they're going to have to go back in and figure out how to do that do wiring and what those kinds of things were were meant for um, if we're able to to um, bring on the architect that had done the original plan set we can squeeze this this timeline much shorter I think that they have some um, some trepidation about moving forward with us on that level but you know I'm hopeful that we won't have to completely reproduce the plan set this is a very very conservative time estimate so anyone else what more you hear from the architect are concerned about litigation so they don't want to engage with us is that gist of it I have not spoken to them personally but I um, the contractors who have have expressed that interesting yes, sir um, this is more of a question for uh, mr. Moore have we identified how we're funding this Yes, we've included funding in the 2022-2023 proposed budget, so that's been incorporated. And just in the CFP, to the, just the general budget? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I guess that's conversation for next Monday. It's coming Monday, yes, sir. Thank you. Are you not thinking you'd want to put forth the money? I mean, what option do we have? We'll discuss it on Monday. Okay. Well, that's that's the purpose of Monday's workshop is we'll be crunching a lot of numbers right, but if you're saying that you're not going to be wanting to move forward with this uh, and if, if you're saying that and you have support why make her continue to work on it you worry we, we can't leave it the way it is so why, why do I make her continue to work no on no it? why would the city encourage her to continue to work on it if you're your question look the way I see it is we don't have a choice it's, it's our biggest asset in the city and it's sitting there in a state of disarray. What, do we, what are our options? 
Um, I, I'm about to consider a, a budget that's hundreds of line items long, so I, I have to make a lot of considerations, and we always have to cut some things and prioritize other things. So, like I said, on Monday, I'll have that conversation. I don't know how much work you're going to get done in the next six days. I don't think probably a whole lot. So. I would say zero. Yeah. So um, Never know. We'll, we'll discuss it on Monday. So um, anyway, I, I just hope that there's still a respect here between the two here because I'm feeling like there's not the tension so just I, I'm not tense I'm just okay. I would think we I don't see we, any other option but to yeah. move forward and well fix I, our I I don't disagree with you but I, I'm wondering is there any other way of going about this is there an outside source that we could go to that could get this done quicker and then we pay them is there a way because it just feels like government gets in its own way and just slows things down uh private sector i mean nobody would this wouldn't take this long i'm just saying i'm just saying i mean you could build a building with everything in it for less time the whole well there's some exposed wires i'm not trying to mitigate i mean i'm not trying to lessen it but that's their job to know where those are coming from and if it needs to be replaced so it shouldn't take months to kind of analyze that um so my thoughts are is there another way that we can do this maybe mr moore i don't know who i should even so be directing this to one of the one of the ways that we shorten a construction timeline is by utilizing different purchasing methods mm -hmm. By going with the job order contracting, that cuts out all of the time for solicitation and having external parties come in and, and bid, bid on the project. Okay. So right there, we're saving six months in the, in the process. Mm -hmm. um, we can do everything in our power. We, because there are so many unknowns for staff, we hate to promise you that we can do something in right. two weeks and then it takes us two months. Mm -hmm. right. um, so we, we will always under promise and overachieve, but I don't know how much we can cut this timeline. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, direction has been offered to proceed with the various purchasing strategies and methods we've talked about so as to be as expeditious as possible. Nevertheless, it is a, an upcoming fiscal year 2022-2023 and Budget Mr. Moore, you have basically said that you will be looking at um, getting information back from uh, people who are um, kind of experts in the area to know if we're going in the right direction. Is that I think I think that would be appropriate mm -hmm. as we continue to okay. proceed. All right, very good. Thank you so much. I don't mean to give you a hard time. I'm just it's all right. That's uh, what I'm here wanting for. to get this done quicker than not, but it looks like it's going to take a little longer. Um, Thank you. I would also say that since we're in, this isn't for you, but since we're talking about the Crest Theater, I don't know if everybody got the same, you know, emails that I received with respect to Crest Theater. And I'm sorry, the Old School Square nonprofit. The why? Yes, the why. And the signage that they're posting around town. Um, when was this email? I don't think I got it. Oh, a couple days ago. We were at the conference. Yeah, I don't yeah you guys were, you guys missed it. But anyway, it's still out there, and you're gonna, there's signage around and asking people if they'd like to, you know, get signs of the why, um, why uh, it's basically it's it's dark or whatever. I would make a suggestion, and I'd like to um, uh, just see if there's consensus here um, on the same thing to put signage on old school square grounds as to what's going on, and uh, something very simple. Yeah. Um, basically, you know, kind of like a new under new management, and we're excited about a bright future. Um, uh, that type of thing on the horizon. I mean, I think that it might not be a bad idea because Under renovation. Yeah, I mean, it will at least let people know that we're in the process of moving forward because the 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 there's a lot of misinformation getting out there that we're not and that nothing's really happening. I think it's important. And where else to put it than right on the grounds where it's happening? Yeah. All right. If that's yeah. I, I would be supportive once we once we have a plan. Yeah, I mean, once it's a plan and a funded plan and a timeline, mm -hmm. I would love to have a board up there that explains all. Well, that. I think we'll know that you know, by something Monday. Something that's reactive. So we can maybe cross it over again on Monday because we'll be talking about that. So if it's yeah. on a line item, then we can maybe do that. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. All right, so now we are at the point where we are um, asking the public if there's anything you'd like to step forward and speak about. This would be your time. So. What you need to do is, um, the meeting is now open to public comment. Anyone wishing to speak about a topic of an item that is not a quasi-judicial and not a public hearing item, you'll have the opportunity to speak for three minutes or six minutes if you have a group that's present that will promise not to speak and they stand for you. 
So please state your name and address, and then you have three minutes. Montre Bennett, 323 Northwest 2nd Avenue, Derby, Beach, 33444. Y'all are funny. Um, if no people would have continued that old school square, we wouldn't be in this situation. Uh, and <laughs> she just put uh, the $935,000 for discussion. I hope y'all are not going to use that for old school square and let it go to be towards Pompey Park. Um, the other thing on y'all agenda is about this 40 year deed restriction. Um, the people got 15 years with the county. Y'all want to give people 40 years. I think y'all should deduct the 15 years from the 40 and just let it be 25 years. Um, thank you for the proclamation for Child Safety Day. I don't know what can of worms would be open with my son. They ain't being mentioned on it. Um, my son was two years old. He loved life. And he just ran out into the road. Nothing no one could do about it. I watched him run out into the road, sitting in my car. There's nothing I could do about it. Um, but yeah, put the can, put the worms back in the can, because I don't know what that would do for anybody. However, there's no place for Captain, for kids at Captain Strong with that big hole in them uh, portables. Y'all need to do something about that. Um, and let's be collective. Let's work together for strategic investment placement, placemaking, a healthy community, community wealth building, civic stewardship. And let's just learn how to be together and not try and keep us divided. Uh, I invite y'all Saturday at Coco Plum Nature School, open house for a holistic wellness circle. Come get some mindfulness for your life. Maybe you'll be free. Maybe you'll be open to new things and not the old way of living. My name is Montre, and I'm out. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I got one more thing. And is it a conflict of interest for a CRA board members to solicit sales in their district? Solicit what? Sales. Is it a conflict of interest for CRA board members to solicit land sales in the district that they sit on the board for? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, hi, my name's Nancy Channon. I live at um, 200 Northeast Second Avenue. And speaking of signage, I know this was discussed briefly at the last meeting. I wasn't there. But as I think you all know that I've been working on political campaigns for a very long time. And I'm just befuddled as to why there is not a single sign at our early voting site, which I fought to have to get here. Um, but there are no signs. Um, and I know not everyone loves campaign signs, but they're kind of a fact of life. They're at all the other 14, I think it is, early voting sites. So I did speak to code. I was told they don't put them in front of government buildings, but um, pretty much every early voting site is a government building of some sort. So I'm just really confused. The other thing is people still, not everyone knows that we are voting here because it's still relatively new. And as much as they're an eyesore to some people, I think if people saw them out there, you know, they'd go, oh, there's voting there. I, I know I saw you put up a big thing that says early voting, and that's fabulous. But I, you all have my number. If somebody could just explain, and it's only for two weeks, you know, you want to put signs up at Old School Square. The police department has temporary signs up for a blood, blood bank. So I'm just confused. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Rob Long, 2962 Calabria Way, Delray Beach. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, last night, I attended my last planning and zoning meeting as a board member. I had the privilege of serving two terms over those four years, two of those as Vice Chair. First, I'd like to thank the Commission for providing me with this opportunity to serve Delray Beach by unanimously appointing me to two terms on the Planning and Zoning Board the Site Plan Review and Appearance Board before that, and the Green Implementation Advancement Board before that. Last night marked the end of six consecutive years of providing volunteer service to our city's advisory boards. 
I'm very proud of the work and service I've been able to provide for Delray Beach. Last Tuesday, however, some of you saw it fit to block my nomination to the city's historic preservation board. To state it plainly, this body voted 3-2 to stop a qualified resident from volunteering to help our city. It's disappointing and abnormal. Now, I'd like to address some of the comments made last meeting about my record on the Planning and Zoning Board. To clear up any confusion, attendance records show I missed two Planning and Zoning Board meetings this year. One of them was due to being sick with COVID, and I informed staff beforehand in both cases. Last year, I missed one meeting, and I missed zero the year before that. So comments made referencing alleged complaints heard from city staff about my attendance are not factual. Similarly, accusations about my decorum were also false. The same commissioner who attempted to appoint me to the Historic Preservation Board has stated on the record multiple times that staff had absolutely no complaints about my decorum. Since the topic of decorum is so interesting, let's touch on that for a minute. To me, an example of poor decorum is using your elected position to attack perceived political adversaries. Poor decorum is blocking public input while at the same time evicting the cultural and philanthropic heart of our city. Poor decorum is dismissing credible threats to the quality of our drinking water. Poor decorum is voting to give yourself a raise as an elected official in the middle of a pandemic. I'm proud of my record to help move Delray Beach forward, and I'm planning on staying engaged, involved, and active in our city's future. And I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Madam Mayor, Commissioners, Mr. Moore. My name is Angie Gray, and um, I'm a licensed realtor that can sell property anywhere in South Florida or Florida. Um, and I do serve on the CRA, and I am running to be your next city commissioner. Um, I'm here because I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. Mobley did an excellent job this evening by giving us a presentation, explaining everything about the ELE and the connection. Um, our license agreement, we do have a contract with them, but we can amend that contract and still have all the programs that we have. Um, I asked that you, I mean, it was a great idea that you all came with, up with and said, okay, we have two facilities, but staff found out that we could actually utilize and we could have utilized that other facility all, all along. Um, so I would ask that you would have them to go ahead and move forward with using that, uh, utilizing that secondary um, building, whether it's at, I'm, I'm thinking that it should be at the community center instead of Pompey Park because that is the larger and we only have 76 children. So if we could go ahead and do that and put a date certain on that, I would certainly appreciate it. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Angie. And thanks for clarifying. I had no idea what we were talking about earlier. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good evening uh, or good afternoon. Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority. So I just uh, wanted to give you all a couple updates uh, from the DDA. First, I'd like to uh, share that at our we um, meeting last uh, week, we did have board elections. And um, uh, Mavis Benson, I'm happy to report, is our new chair woman congratulations for the downtown development authority so um well and our vice chair is al costello dr al costello mm -hmm. from big al stakes um vera woodson is our secretary and mark dinkler is our treasurer this year so we do have uh, a brand new executive committee or sort of a new executive committee for this year um, and we're planning and our we're coming to you next uh, month with our um, budget uh, for with our budget hearing and we're in full planning mode for uh, our fiscal year coming forward so look for that um, in our next board meeting September 12th um, we have discussion there but I wanted to also let you know that um, we're we are in launching restaurant month in September. We moved it to September this year. It traditionally is in August, but downtown Dari Beach restaurant month. We have over 50 restaurants participating. So we have these outside in the lobby um, at downtowndarrybeach.com. Everybody can get their information, but we'll be kicking that off with an activation in conjunction with Discover the Palm Beaches, which is our county partner who has Palm Beach County's restaurant month in August. We have an activation uh, this Friday at Old School Square Park on the Second Avenue side with a little pop-up activation with some restaurants coming out, give some tastings, and um, talking about 
the um, August restaurant month in the county as well as September. So that'll be from 5 to 7. So we hope everybody will come out and just uh, say hi and have some fun. It is, um, it is fun in downtown, so just come out and visit us. But again, downtowndarbeach.com, and then just thank you. We'll have all of our information and calendar of events and everything that are happening on that site as well. So uh, thank you for all you do, and um, if you have any questions, just let us know. Thank Thanks, you. Laura. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is closed. I want to add one note, and I think that uh, it's important to um, understand, especially for those that are listening in, um, this board did make a decision not to um, bring on a board member. There were other board members that were also equally, um, uh, you know, uh, qualified, and in addition to that, uh, there were um, not just one, but several instances that this particular board member made um, comments that were very disparaging towards in, in the city's realm and was corrected by city staff and continued to make those comments and, and, uh, and send them out to people who were very, very upset about our water. Our water has not changed a bit, not one iota. We haven't changed anything in the system. We haven't changed any kind of like, uh, you know, uh, filtration systems um, since all of that hoopla that was happening about the water in the process of my running for election. So um, I was named as the person, I don't have anything to do with the water, none, zero, never even, I mean, I was the first time I ever went to the water plant was this year, this past year. Um, so it was very, very um, difficult. And uh, so talk about bringing politics into, you know, your board position, shouldn't do it. Um, and it certainly wasn't something that the city had a, uh, it struggled with um, trying to get in front of uh, the negative um, uh, campaign that was underway with respect to our water. If our water was so bad, why aren't we talking about it today? Why haven't we talked about it in the last, I don't know, few months? Because it's meeting the qualifications from what I, our, our, our experts, not us up here, but our experts are talking about. So when you step outside of that realm and you've been asked to um, correct and you don't, um, it's not a good look for the city. There were a lot of people here that thought that they were drinking water that was really bad for them. So that's, I'm going to make that statement and let it be. And um, I stand by the, the decision that I made um, last week. Motion to approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Second. All right, call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. All right, moving on to what was a 7C, now, I'm sorry, 6C, now 7AA approval of resolution number 116-22. I believe that uh, Commissioner Johnson, you took this off for discussion. Yes, I did, Mayor. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I understood that we were receiving funding from the state. Mm -hmm. However, after reading the explanation of what uh, actions had to be taken by the city and not really being able to see, number one, how long we had these funds available with the explanations that were given. I thought we should at least get that on the record. Um, I know when we have something, usually it's a year to year, but can you tell us how long these funds will be available? Um. Well, I'd like, I'd like to first, yes, uh, Sam Mitad again, Parks and Recreation Director. Um, just what you have here, this and another item for the Catherine Strong lo location, these are procedural uh, approvals that we need as far as the grant application process. And when we submit, we had to submit, once awarded and approved for the funding, we then had to have it put into a capital improvement plan, which our team did when we brought forth the first capital improvement, and it'll be approved when if and when you approve it on the capital improvement side. But also it has to be approved via resolution. So that's the procedural of, of this item to accept those funds. So the, I, the way it would work is we budget it as a capital item. We, we do these projects and this would fund, the grant would fund it back to the city. May I ask a question? But we're okay. planning on doing so much work there. So will a portion of this be reserved for that or are we doing this work prior to? This, this would be prior part? to, but in, in the understanding that we can use most of these items in the future, we're going to. Perfect. We're already working with the team to make sure, like the kitchen equipment, for example, which mm -hmm. is one of the examples, that we can use it now in that building and gets us through the, the next few years, but also that it would be the right, um, you know, 
okay. specifications for the future. The shade building. structure, I think. So, the shade structure. So you haven't answered my question. How long are these funds available. for this grant available? I, I believe we have a year to in, to do these projects, but uh, I think Missy can. Oh, three years. I apologize. Three years. Three years. It's very good. And because my understanding was that we were going to be given the money, we wouldn't have to come out of our pockets. But no, you have to expend the funds, then apply for them. So we have to be very careful as to our record keeping, et cetera. Not that I'm accusing that you and would not be. this is one of be. those record keeping items. Exactly. Absolutely. And I understand the process. It's, it's, it's just that um, I didn't see any time frame. And it was awakening, an awakening to me that we, the city, must come up with the funds, expend them, and then pray for reimbursement. Well, it's already been approved, so. What's already been approved? They approved the, the oh, items. Oh, I know they the have. Yeah. I'm not saying they haven't. It's the process that concerns me. Um, the mayor has in previous times said that um, we've gone around, along with this sometimes after the fact. Grants have been given, and then we, oh, we don't have the money, so we have to go back and say, we can't use these funds because we don't have the money to expend to be reimbursed. So I'm not criticizing you. I'm not saying anything about the process. I think you're matching grants, by the way. Well, it might be, just be that, yeah. but mm -hmm. um, it's the same process. You have to expend. You do not? No, because we're getting it all. We're getting it all back here. We're, After we're you a match expend, yeah, that's right. But funds. we're getting it all back. We're a matching. We I'm don't not get even all back. They match about, our expenses. We actually get nothing back yeah. from what we expend. It's really kind of it. almost like you're going to different things. Here's here's how I see it, and I maybe this is me. this is maybe this is I don't know. Help. But I, I would Thank just. You. It's kind of almost like going out, then turning in your receipt, and then having them repay you for your receipt. So in other words, going out and buying something and then just handing your receipt over to them, and because it's already, it's, it's earmarked for this, so I don't see us not getting it. Is that, is that an easier analogy? Or? I, I think that was pretty good. Okay. I think we only get it if we do what we say it's expended for. Correct. But exactly. That's, yeah. That was, on, I got and, you. and that was my concern. Yeah. That, um, and I, I might have missed it in the CIP, that I have a copy of. I haven't gotten a chance to speak with Missy about it. It just, as I was preparing for the meeting, I read it, I said, well, wait a minute. Is this like the, um, the transportation funds? Mm -hmm. Where, and I'm not getting it confused, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. I just had a question. How long are the funds available? Do we have it in our CIP? And surprise, surprise, the city has to come up with the money. Ask for reimbursement. I don't care if it's partial, matched, whatever. We have to expend the money and then request reimbursement. And that was all I was saying. Okay. So did you get your question answered? Three years. Okay. So um, can we get a motion? Yes. Motion to, to, motion to approve. Second. All right. Call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Casal? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. All right. Moving on to 7BB, which I believe Thank you. Uh, no problem. City attorney pulled off for explanation. Yes, so this is the Pulte Homes Workforce Housing Covenant for Carver Square, which mm -hmm. was done through the CRA, but because it's a city program, they have to have a, um, a restrictive covenant with the city. I did receive the signed covenant um, from Pulte just a few hours ago. There was one addition to the contract, and I just wanted to put on the record to make sure that you're, you're okay with it. And I know I've spoken to all of you about this. This, co this covenant does not go into effect unless and until the Palm Beach County covenant expires. Mm -hmm. um, I know you're all familiar with Palm Beach. Um, Palm Beach is a workforce housing ordinance, but what they do is it's a 15 year covenant. If the property is sold or transferred Renews. or conveyed during that 15 years, it starts over. Mm -hmm. so there's a possibility that our covenant may not even come into play mm -hmm. if it gets turned over three times, gotcha. because then it would be 45 years. Right. So throughout the covenant, we just wanted to make it very clear to any future purchase, purchasers that this covenant does not come into play unless and until the Palm Beach County covenant is, is terminated, expires, or is no longer in effect. And so there was in section 3.3 .3, subsection C, they did add that this section discusses additional resale restrictions. Our ordinances are a little bit different than Palm Beach County and it talks about different ways that the property um, would be um, transferred and it would be okay to transfer it, death, Mm -hmm. um, transfer within the family, things like that. And all they did was put the qualifier in there that says upon expiration of the Palm Beach County compliance period, and then it has our language. 
I'm not concerned about that qualifier. It's throughout the entire document. It's just one more safeguard that they've added. But I just wanted to put that on the record. If you're comfortable moving forward, we can just approve it as amended. Um, otherwise, I'll just put it on the next agenda so that you can see the final copy. I will email you the final copy just so you have it for your records. And I will give it to the clerk so that she can add it to the uh, agenda. Okay. Any questions or concerns? Otherwise, so, entertain a motion. So I'm, I'm understanding that you will be bringing this back as a clear? No. Or our vote today will no, agree no. to? Okay. Thank you. This, this is a master covenant. So this is the one for the entire property. Each property that gets sold will have a deed restriction that references this master covenant. Very good. Thank you. Can I ask just a question, though? I guess for clarity for the owner and future potential buyers why aren't they just running side by side even they though it wouldn't right. kick in they are they're okay. they're concurrent they were running at the same time so this master covenant will will kick in okay. once it's recorded the only difference is is that it may not even have any effect on some of the properties right. if the if the property gets transferred um, more than two times exactly exactly so it's it, so in other words it's not adding the the extra years that we would be having on to any no no yeah. they're running side by side exactly and then once and once that 40 years is over it's over for our purposes right. once the 40 years runs it runs now for palm beach it could it could still go on if it's continuing to train change hands we understand thank you all right motion, motion to, to approve, approve. second as, as amended as amended, as amended. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a motion and a second, and I'm going to say that that was by Boylston and with uh, Casal as the second. Please call the roll. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Okay, unanimous approval. Okay, moving on to our regular agenda, and we're going to start with 7A. This is a quasi-judicial hearing, so I'm going to read the quasi-judicial rules into the record and I just want everybody to know if you are going to be speaking to 7A we're going to ask you to stand and um, and be sworn in um, and I think that's the only quasi-judicial hearing that we have on this on the schedule which is tr which is correct so if you're going to be we'll do that in just a second just a second let me go ahead and read the quasi-judicial rules into the um, into the record this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. The applicant and the city shall be allowed 20 minutes each to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a six minute, or maximum of six minutes if a person representing an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission, staff, and the applicant will be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city and the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not be legally made upon personal views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the number of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be based, made based on whether the project meets the requirements of law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. At this point in time, um, we are going to have every, anybody who wants to speak to um, this be sworn in. Raise your right hand, please. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, so at this point, anybody who comes up to speak, just make sure that you, when you're um, giving your name and address, that you also indicate that you've been sworn in at this point in time. Let's um, talk about ex parte communication. So let's start with the commission. Um, we'll start with the deputy vice mayor. Uh, items on the server in the form of emails, and I spoke to Mr. Iliopoulos. Okay. I spoke with Commissioner E, a.k.a. Gary Iliopoulos, and uh, got an email that I responded to from a Caroline Delafield. There you go. And Commissioner Boylston? Had a conversation with Mr. Cohen, and of course, any emails on the server. And Commissioner Johnson? I believe everything's on the server. I haven't, don't remember any personal. Yeah, same with me. I was out of town, so I didn't get an opportunity of sitting down with anybody. So we are good to go at this point. Let's go ahead and have the um, file, project file entered into the record. Um, good evening. For the record, I'm the Ingeniotis Development Services Director, and I would like to enter file number 22-131 into the record. And uh, Mr. Iliopoulos and I believe Mr. Cohen are here with a presentation to go over their requests. Very good. I, I'd like to request an extra five minutes, if we can, for our for our presentation. I think I think you should address it once the time period has expired, and if additional time is necessary, then it's your discretion. Okay. So you've got the twenty minutes now, but you can request more if if it's needed. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Cohen. I live at eleven forty Bohemia Road. Uh, I've been a 
resident of Delray for 40 years. And um, um, I, when I moved here in 82, I felt that Delray could be a special place being so close to the beach and so close to 95. And that I, I could really make this city come alive if we can get some people down here. And um, I realized we needed some restaurants and attractions to get people to the downtown that share a common experience. Not everyone may remember how that happened. Uh, I know Ms. Simon has been here long enough. Ms. Johnson has been here long enough. There's probably a couple other people who have been here 40 years. But I, I want to just run through the, uh, the genesis of why did, I'm working on this project. Um, to begin that process, I, I got, bought the building at the corner of 2nd and Atlantic. Um, it had a consignment shop in it, and then I got Louie Louie's in there, and then it became the office. Then next to that was the Twilight Cafe, which became Starbucks, after the owner joined his brother at the Green Al. Then I got the Ace Pump building, and I made that into El Camino. Then I got next to Starbucks, there was American Security, which became Native Sun, which became Coco's. Then I had Art Brion, which became Sunglass Hut. Then I got the VFW, and I made that in the racks. Then I got the Ice Lounge, which became Bull Bar, which became Tin Roof. Then next to that was the Sunset Cafe I brought in, which became Trist and became Tin Roof. Then I brought in Worthing Place, which included Salt and Park Tavern. More importantly, I saw a need for a residential component to the downtown to keep us growing, to keep the young people coming here, to keep revenue strong. And I have some other projects off the Ave, but let's talk about it on the Ave. Well, the city's mayors and staff over the years told me, Steve, you did a great job with the restaurants, but we need some more retail. If you can't help us, please think about it. So that's what I'm here for, some retail tonight. Um, I got the chance when Dave Cook was retiring to uh, buy that old empty retail building, formerly known as Hands, and uh, I saw an opportunity to bring this building into this century by upgrading the lighting, electric, roof, plumbing. It, it needed it all, and it still does. But I believe if we put that building back to its original form, we can really make that block pop for retail. It can really be a destination. Um, when I was marketing the space, every single potential tenant that I talked to said, we love the space, but we need bright, clean windows to show our wares. That's what's conducive to retail. Every other potential tenant said, it's a great place to stand under when it rains, but it's not conducive to us having good retail sales. Now, the restaurants in town, when they're done well, they work here all day. But retail requires a different look, and one that works for the present economic conditions and the market as it changes. So I'm trying to put 325 back to the way it was. I can, by right, knock it down and go three stories and put two stories of office above it. But I feel the better look, the better scale, the better function is to clean it up, keep it one story, and add it to the retail part of Atlantic Ave. Also, the existing building promotes one big store. Our design is four bays, which keeps it in scale to the downtown. So well, Delray is fun, creative, alive, changing, growing, and we're doing it organically. We're not manufacturing it like a Meisner or Boca. So the ability to grow and change and adapt has really been drawing a lot of people here. I hope that you can see retail is the proper balance for this block. As the owner of this building, I am bringing before you what I believe is the best solution for preserving retail sales along the avenue with a building that would be featuring the sales of personal and fashion items. I understand that in order to build this particular design, I must request a waiver and has been asked of me to supply details as to what would be built if the waiver is approved. I am presenting to you these details. I want to be clear that I believe in my professionals with whom I've worked, and I believe my architect when he states that this is the best solution. However, I put on the record that denial of a waiver for this one particular approach is not a denial with respect to any other alternative proposal I might make for this building should this one fail. I am presenting a single plan tonight and reserve all rights on presenting future plans for the building should the need arise. I am relying on this and continuing to make my presentation to you, and I will now let Gary explain the details. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Madam Mayor, uh, Commission, my name is Gary Leopolis for the record. My address is 1045 East Atlantic Avenue. Our firm is GE Architecture. Um, you know, tonight, I was hoping it would be something fairly simple. We are 
talking about a couple waivers. Um, it seems it's gotten a lot more complicated than I anticipated. Um, I believe the city attorney will correct me as I go through and I present things that are not things you will be voting on. I do understand that any proposed elevations are not subject for a vote tonight, but I think it's important when I'm going to ask for waivers that you actually get to see what we're proposing. Uh, at least I would like to when I've been on boards like such as like yourself to see, okay, what are we getting? Uh, it's always a shock if all of a sudden you voted for something then somebody came back with something totally different. You're like, I never anticipated that. So that is our goal tonight to actually show you what we're planning. Uh, let me just get my bearings here with the clicker. I believe probably uh, most of us know where we're located. Uh, we are on the north side of Atlantic Avenue. We are just east of the railroad tracks and west of North uh, East 4th Avenue. As uh, my client mentioned, this was Hans. I think everybody pretty much is familiar with this building. Uh, it's been here a long time. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We did go before the uh, SPRAB board, and some of the members talked about the experience. Um, I think when you have opportunities to travel around the world and everything, you see a lot of architectural buildings and everything, there's an experience. You, you feel it. With Hans, I think it was more about the actual product. Uh, David Cook's products were so unique inside. It was always great taking my kids in there. Uh, they would have fun just looking at the crazy stuff. Um, I don't really believe it was much about the building as opposed to the actual owner and his merchandise. Uh, this is the back of the building. Um, this is Arky Way as far as the alley on the north side. Pretty much most of you uh, would probably be familiar with this. Uh, although this was for uh, deliveries, I think a lot of the people would park in the north side and actually go in. Uh, matter of fact, he had probably the most illegal ramp you could ever go down, but that was fine. It just worked. Um, so here's your, your site plan. Um, basically what we're looking at is this is a building and staff has it in their report and we'll be showing as far as how it evolved over time. Uh, obviously the south side is East Atlantic Avenue. That's the entrance where the arcade is and the north side is where the deliveries and people would go from the parking lot. Um, one of the things I'm pointing out is the, the right of way. One of the things that as we've been working with staff, so, so you know, we started this process in January. Uh, had our pre-application meeting, submitted in January. We've been working with staff over the last handful of months. Uh, some of the stuff that happens when you do a class three application, staff comes back and they start looking for additional right of way. So I am highlighting that the existing right of way right now is at 66 feet. Uh, this was actually the comp plan in the early 2000s. Um, I'm highlighting basically Atlantic Avenue between Sinton, Swinton and Federal Highway. The roadway is in what we call the TCEA, an area which is exempt from traffic and currency and widening is actually inconsistent with the downtown plans. You'll see right in here highlighting what was basically requested back then. You're looking at basically 60 to 66 feet. Now, uh, the new comp plan that was approved in 2020 is actually in the same area, is basically bumping it up. Now, from Swinton to Federal or to the railroads, it's 65. Again, that bumped up from 60. And then from Atlantic, uh, when you're dealing with the railroads to Fifth, it's going to 70. Um, I know last month you had a workshop on historic structures in this area, and you're looking at that. I think it's kind of, I guess I'm confused when we start looking at taking additional right away. And you're going to see in this presentation that within our block, we actually have several buildings that exceed into the setback more than our building. And what we're reducing by a arcade is actually even taking us further away. Um, in this case, when you do a right of way, uh, an additional two feet, you're actually taking part of the building. Uh, it does, just doesn't seem logical, but I understand what staff has to do, and that's what they have to uh, request due to this application. So this is right out of your LDRs. Central core subdivision, as far as the districts go, the central core subdistrict regulations are intended to result in a development that preserves the downtown historic moderate scale while promoting a balanced mix of uses that will help the area evolve into a traditional self-sufficient downtown. I think our, our client has already described what he's already done over the last few years, uh, matter of fact, 30 or 40. Um, we're talking about balance. We're talking about getting retail downtown. Now, one of the biggest things I remember over the years was we don't want big corporations coming in with the big chains. We're talking about three right now, at least two that are going to be almost what you consider mom and pop. We got Morley's. They're on the Ave. They're moving in here. We got Coco Company. They're on the Ave. They're moving in there. And they're going to be right next door to their other uh, place, which is Periwinkle. This is the retail you want, folks. We got we to gotta decide on how we want to get a balance. And then when we start talking about what my client mentioned about the arcade, we want it to be successful. 
There's always things you want to be looking at when you're doing retail downtown to see how can we be competitive with all the other retail stores. Uh, this is a survey, so it's a little hard to read, but basically what I'm trying to highlight is what you have on the Ave right now. Uh, we're talking about this is the current property line that I did on the top part in red. You're seeing Periwinkle. You're seeing 325 East Atlantic Avenue. That is our project. You're seeing Hubert Health Mart, and then you're seeing the Lionfish. Just to the west of Lionfish is actually uh, Johnny Brown's. Now, what's interesting is the fact is Lionfish, Johnny Brown's, and Periwinkle all exceed well beyond our building into the setbacks. So when we start talking about taking additional right away, we talk about how we want to start working on these buildings. You have to be looking at these things when you're looking at a waiver. Would you ever consider other buildings getting a certain type of waiver in order to preserve what we're talking about, the scale and the historic character of the downtown? Uh, right here, the part that I just highlighted, which is either red or pink, depending on how hard your eyes are, um, we're basically talking about storefront. We're talking about an existing building footprint and we're asking to actually straighten out the storefront. It's kind of a sawtooth pattern. If for any was familiar with the stores, Vince Canning actually had almost like a horseshoe type thing, which was quite typical in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, where you walk in, you get to see the shoes on the side, and you went into the store. The fact is, it creates a dead zone. When you start looking at the arcane, you start doing this stuff, you start talking about all the pedestrian flow that we're trying to do, all the clear zones, all this kind of stuff, if that, anything's happening here, it's actually preventing a safety thing and it's preventing retail from succeeding. Um, here's an aerial. Uh, it's basically a drone that we took just last week. We're showing in yellow our building, where we are. Now, it's not showing the arcade. The arcade, you can almost see, is like a reddish brown going down further. But you're seeing where the actual property line is. And you're seeing where Johnny Brown's is. You're seeing the lionfish, those are on the left-hand side, and then go far to the uh, right, and then you all of a sudden will see that you basically have, wait, let me go back. Well, I guess I don't know how to go back to, uh, let's see here. Okay, you start seeing Bank United and Periwinkle actually extend out. So I'm just trying to get that point across that uh, they're actually four foot seven feet different from us. Uh, I think that's just important to understand where our facade is versus everybody else. So staff does talk about uh, when the building was built, there's a, a comment about, I think it's 1921, which would be more like Vince Canning. Our records show from the original drawings that was 1934. I don't think there's a big difference there. They're obviously older buildings. You'll see in the back, it was added on in 58. And then it had two more additions in 74, both in the front, which was the arcade, and the rear. So as we look at this, here's the arcade. We're talking about the depths. One of the things that we want to point out is the, the LDRs do give you guidelines and actually incentives to have these arcades. They definitely do. Matter of fact, staff has talked about that this was one that they actually worked with their design guidelines and actually used as an example. I would tell you that it's, it's actually not the best example because it's very deep, okay? It's dark. It doesn't create the atmosphere that actually is conducive to retail. It actually helps for restaurants. It's perfect to have an outdoor dining. Um, the sawtooth glass, uh, this is more about the retailers. They're basically saying that, you know what, it's a lot easier when we have 90 degree angles and it actually makes it better for us laying it out. Obviously, Vince Canning's shoe store with it that far deep doesn't help the retail. Uh, this is basically responding to what the uh, tenants are saying to my client. So these are your setbacks. Uh, you're looking at your 10 foot as far as your minimum and you've got your 15. So obviously the blue is where the existing building is. We know it's non-conforming. And of course you can see where the arcade goes right out to the street. Along the right hand side, the east side if you will, the building actually goes in approximately seven and a half inches into the public right of way as of right now. Uh, same with Periwinkle building. Um, so right now what you're talking about, we would be taking the storefront and we're moving it out to the existing building footprint, which are the columns which is approximately six foot one that we want to slide down. What happens with the setback increasing is because of the public right of way that we're adding another two feet. One of the things that we're highlighting again here is this is the actual things that we're asking for. We're switching the glass. The actual doors in three of the bays are staying where they are. It's actually Vince Canning's side that actually we are moving it out towards the front. Uh, you'll see that the building is on an angle like that. That's not something that we created. And it's 376 square feet. Again, that's kicking in the class three application that we're dealing with. Now we are trying to break up the facade. Uh, we're trying to add some decorative columns. Uh, these decorative pilaster columns 
are not much more intrusive than what you actually already have in your building code. We do allow structures to go into the building code, such as stoops going up to uh, a townhouse, uh, balconies, overhangs. So basically what we're talking about is something that's non-structural, very slim to an arcade. An arcade, why does an arcade go into a building setback? It's because it's perceived to be removable. Should the city ever have to expand right-of-ways, an arcade can be removed, and that's how they're typically designed with the LDRs. <coughs> Uh, one of the things that we'd like to highlight is it's really been important with what they call the pedestrian clear zone. We're maintaining that. We're keeping that all along the avenue, being consistent with it. Right here, that's called the curb zone. That is from the pedestrian zone right up to the curb along the street. And again, now this is with a two-foot right-of-way dedication. So now that's where our setbacks that are encroaching got increased by the two feet. Now we're blowing up each bay so you can just get a better idea what we're talking about. And I know this is a lot of repetitiveness, but it seemed like when we went to the SPRAB board, it got a little confusing, so we wanted to add a few more slides just so everybody understood what we were proposing. Uh, those are the decorative pilasters, and you'll be seeing those in the elevations. They would be projecting two, and a half, two feet, one inch. And then that's where you have the storefront, and you basically are showing that we got nine foot nine out to the front of the pilasters from the original or the 10 foot minimum setback. This is a section through the existing arcade. Here we're showing our dimensions. We're showing where the actual storefront goes back. There's the existing facade of the building that was built originally. Here's the area that we're basically talking about. We're talking about we want to take the storefront and we want to slide it over. That's all we're talking about. It seems like it would be relatively simple, but I realize that it's causing a lot of anxiety for some people on some of the other boards. Uh, in downtown, but here's the building. One of the things you got to look at is storefront, the storefront criteria that we have. Okay, when we start talking about this is the, the building that's set in the uh, guidelines for arcades, he also talks about the minimum. Glass, storefront glass. Storefront glass should be a minimum of eight feet high. Ours is seven feet. Again, when you start talking about an arcade, you're talk talking about our glass being set back and we don't even meet the minimums and that's what's going to kill our retail. Uh, we're basically just saying, hey, we want to take the glass and we want to bring it out to where the existing concrete beams and columns are. Same with this one. Now, Vince Canning is a little different. Uh, this is the one that I did point out that actually the building as it is right now projects into the public right of way by seven and a half inches. Uh, now, obviously, it gets increased because we now have the two foot right of way. Uh, on all these facades, we're actually proposing some decorative elements, so we are requesting to increase it by two inches because we're actually putting on a different type of material onto the building, which would approximately project it out two more inches. Um, I, you know, you talk about, I mentioned earlier, the dead zone. I mean, you're talking about 12 foot, nine and a half inches just from the basic of the front of the building, not the storefront, I mean, not the arcade, just where the storefront is. That's what we would consider a dead zone. It's not a good thing at night. Uh, I think this is something we should always be looking at. Uh, this is, again, the store as it is right now. Now, that right there, the base, what you call the sill of the glass, it's approximately two feet. That is part of the criteria. The minimum has to be a foot. So that does meet that part, but the height of it is actually still at seven feet for the glass. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, okay? It's the arcade. That's really what all this is driving about. We would not be here tonight about if we didn't have this arcade. Okay, because we basically wouldn't be having to deal with stuff. The arcade allows you to go into the right of way. We are actually changing the glass and all of a sudden that becomes the issue. Uh, again, when you're looking at this, my client mentioned it's one large arcade. Now, architecturally, I'm not ranking on anything, but I'm saying it's not distinguished from anything else. It's not telling you the different stores that are in there. Sure, somebody can say, well, you can put up different signs. That doesn't help the retail. Look at that picture, it's dark in there. Okay, we want things to be successful. There was a time and a purpose for this, but it's amazing that we actually, when we went to the DDA, Mark Dankler, who was the owner of Vince Canning, said, listen, we owned it before it had an arcade, and we owned it afterwards. He said the arcade was nice for people to stand in the rain, but it didn't bring in people. So I think it's important that we understand this. I think more importantly, we're talking about historicness. I get that, uh, but you gotta look at proportions. Um, this. This arcade's all the wrong proportions. At the tightest part of the arch, it's at six foot six. When you go to the top part, it's nine six. Those do not meet the minimum requirements that we ask for our city guidelines. Our city guidelines are a minimum of 10 feet up to 20 feet in height. 
that allows the openings to be large so you can see. You want to see this across the street. Remember, we have cars all parked in front of that during the day and everything. It's blocking the views. We want to try and encourage people. Is it possible? I'm okay, but just you can wrap it up. Okay. I, mean, I think we, I think we're, I think we understand what you're trying to say, and I mean, just make your points that are really important. Okay, this was added in 1974. It is not historic. It's not original. It's in front of the building. It was added on. Uh, again, proportions. I will show you what the city looks at as far as being the criteria for the guidelines. This was the example that they used. These, these right here, deep. That's what they showed. That's a shallow, high arcade. That's more appropriate. I'll just go through. Some of the arcades in town, they're between six and eight feet, and they're usually around 12 feet in height. Makes a big difference on how you're doing your retail. This is a smaller one. This is basically demonstrating how the lion fishes out beyond us. Uh, I'm not, I, you know, they can create that clear zone of six feet, even though that was measuring shy, but 10 foot four, we're measuring everything off of Hoover Drugs. And there's our front facade, which is actually five foot nine in front of Hubert, which is actually four seven back of this building. So we are actually helping the pedestrian flow along in here. We're obviously doing all the required landscaping that's required. Uh, the city actually has their light pole. If you will light fixture on our building, we're actually replacing it with a new light pole so you have proper lighting in the street. I'll just go through the back. That's basically just developing the landscaping. Uh, one of the things that when we were at uh, Sprab and DDA was talking about, are we creating a new facade, new images? Um, again, the yellow is basically talking about the pilasters that we're adding. There's the storefront that we wanted to straighten out. Here are the different various materials that we're doing, which is brick veneer, raised stucco banding. Uh, we're creating transoms over everything to give the illusion that it's taller storefront. It's actually going to be lit in the back, but it actually will not be part of the store that you see in. So at this point, um, I am going to interject. Okay. Um, this is a waiver today. This is not a site plan approval. So I, I understand why you're showing this, but I think at this point it's getting repetitive. Okay. So what I'll do is. Other waivers. Do you want to mention the other waivers? Yeah, I'll go. Oh, well. I just let me go to then just read what we're dealing with. Uh, I hear you. I hear you. I'm just going as quick as I can. Uh, LDR section 4.413. I mean, if you if you don't want me to read this, I won't. But I, this is what I was planning. Huh? Yeah, it was just basically the waiver shall not result in an inferior pedestrian experience along the primary streets, such as exposing parking garages and large expanse of blank walls. Uh, folks, I don't think we are doing that. I think we're being very compatible with the surrounding buildings. Uh, we're having our five-foot awnings as all the other buildings, and we're keeping the pedestrian experience the same. Uh, the waiver shall not allow the creation of significant incompatibilities with the nearby buildings or the use of the land. Again, I think we're maintaining that. We've got our clear zone, and we got our curb zone. Uh, the waiver shall not erode the connectivity of the street and the sidewalk network, negatively impacting adopted by the bicycle pedestrian master plan. By taking out the arcade, although that's not part of what you're talking about, uh, even as we increase our storefront glass, we are not reducing the flow along this area that would actually impact the bicycles. The waiver shall not reduce the quality of the civic open spaces providing under this code. Uh, I don't believe that we're going to be encroaching any of those areas, and I don't even think that actually comes into play with what we're proposing. Uh, section L, or Section 247B5, waiver findings, shall not adversely affect the neighborhood. Again, I think if anything, this is not adversely affecting the neighborhood. I think it's actually helping the pedestrian flow. Uh, so I know I realize a lot of this is protect, uh, repetitive. Uh, shall not diminish, significantly diminish the provision of the public facilities. Not going to have any bearing on the public facilities. If anything, we're providing a light that is not provided at the moment, except on our building. Shall not create an unsafe situation. Uh, I don't think by relocating glass that would cause any kind of unsafe situation. I think it actually promotes it because we don't have dead zones within our building. Does not result in the grant of a special privilege that in the same waiver would be granted under similar circumstances under the property for other applicants or owners. There's already been other waivers that this commission and or privers that have actually granted waivers right in this section on this block. Uh, we believe if you do have a building that's non-conforming 
and it is maintaining the scale of the downtown character, you'd want to grant the same waivers. Thank you very much. Sorry I took yeah. more time. Staff report. Okay. I actually think this issue is much more simple than um, what we, and he's an architect, so he deals in the feet and the inches, right? Um, so this issue is actually comes up occasionally for buildings, um, and um, the need for a waiver was caught rather late in their review, um, and when the uh, project was moved to a more experienced planner, it was identified, and we've moved them as quickly as possible through to make sure um, everything is ready to go to SPRAB um, properly. Um, so this is an existing building. Um, and while, the, as I always refer to it, the invisible line of where is the right of way and where is the property line is moving, that actually doesn't affect this um, um, issue except that how we measure the amount of what you're voting on in your resolution is defined by the right of way moving. The building is non-conforming. It is positioned in a way that is non-conforming. If you are going to increase the non-conformity, just infilling the facade and moving it forward is increasing the nonconformity that requires a waiver and they are considered individually there have been a number here um, in this area that have been needed I'll remind them to you when I get to that slide so the invisible line is moving um, whether uh, it's here or here this the facade that exists today and the arcade are forward of that if the desire is simply to remove the arcade, I think that I, I don't think that we would need a waiver. It's the infill of the facades at this point that um, is increasing nonconformity. And while the arcade is, um, I think certainly has a value to our community, it's, it's been stated over and over again, um, the building, if we were looking at it under a historic lens, which we are not, um, it qualifies both with or without it. So this isn't about the arcade as much as it is about we have adopted streetscape and setback standards in response to the amount of pedestrian congestion that we have particularly on Atlantic Avenue. So um, it's that these facades go back and the idea is to pull them forward which kind of reduces that sort of natural extension of the streetscape where people can stop and look in the windows um, beyond the standards that we have adopted. So it's kind of weird because the facade, they could infill the, they could infill the storefronts and still meet the frontage standards. Take off the arcade, you're still okay. Take off the arcade and fill it in. Now you're hitting the pedestrian issues and I'll, I'll try to show it as quickly as I can because I think you have a thorough reveal. So the removal of the arcade does change how we do setbacks. If you have an arcade and it's at least 10 feet deep, you don't have to back up anymore because like they said, hey, it gets really dark. So once the arcade comes off, then we look at the setbacks and that includes all pieces of the building. And the decision is if you're taking off the front of the building, do you pull it forward? Do you push it back? That's ultimately what we're talking about here. Um, so the waiver is to the front setback, and again, while it is a valued part, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this because you've gotten a good view. So the way that our setbacks and our streetscapes are married, because in downtown, the front setback is kind of part of the right-of-way. It's designed very cohesively to make the most of the address, both, both for the private property owner and for the city, to create a great experience downtown for everyone. So to do that, the minimum curb zone is four feet. That's where we put traffic lights and street lights and street trees and all those things that, uh, that have to happen. You have to have a minimum clear zone of six feet. So wherever you're putting landscaping, if you're doing any kind of outdoor dining, whatever's going on, you got to have six feet clear. And I, I know we've discussed whether that's even enough mm. these days. And then because um, this invisible line shifts a little bit. There's typically a remaining front setback. Um, you guys see a lot of pedestrian clear zone easements coming through where a foot or 18 inches or two feet is used to hit that six foot clear zone. 
whatever is left is typically at least five feet of it needs to be um, detailed as part of the streetscape. So the reason there's two waivers is that by infilling the setback, the setback's coming forward, increasing a non-conforming position of the building, and you're encroaching into the streetscape a little bit more than you do now. So that's the big issue. Um, and so you can see what's being proposed. You have a four foot minimum curb zone. The tree's probably gonna be more in the middle of it, but um, ultimately there will be shade trees matching what's on Atlantic now if the arcade is removed. A six foot clear zone, and then you can see that the, the um, distance to the face of the building is 3-2. There's added pilasters coming in, so it's even less than that. So there's a little less room to like shift out of the way, stop and talk to somebody, and keep that six foot clear zone moving, which is why we need the waiver. Um, so again, it's the infilling of this. Um, and by that invisible line moving, that right of way, Dedication will have to reflect that there's a piece of the building there, or go around it, ultimately. Um, and it's this, so we've got this through the proposed streetscape. We have the six foot clear zone. It's this area that is being impacted by pulling the building forward. Um, and you've already uh, seen these requirements. I think it's important to note, um, while each case has to be um, reviewed um, individually, the building, close to across the street, the SunTrust building that turned into Pier 1. They added pilasters to the outside of that building. During that renovation, they required the same waiver because they were encroaching into that remaining front setback more than was already there. So there really isn't an elephant in the room. It was more of an oversight that we rushed to correct once we found it. Um, so, and then you, again, you've gone over all of the um, the issues, Atlantic Avenue is certainly a primary street, so is infilling that facade going to negatively impact that? And ultimately, this is the decision you have to make. Civic open space does not play here, um, and it's that's it. Okay. So we're here for questions. All right, thank you. All right, so at this point in time, we are going to open um, comments up to the public. So if anybody would like to speak to Resolution number 127-22, please step forward, state name and address, and you will, yep. Again? Sorry. You can, three minutes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Laura Simon from the Downtown Development Authority. Um, and as you know, our board did review this um, actually prior to knowing that there was a waiver required. Um, however, had much discussion um, around this major retail building, and we, um, commend Steve for all of his investment over the years and smart investment. But really looking at um, what you're looking at tonight as far as the infill being detrimental to the street or complementing the street, I think um, as you heard from some of the retailers that were that are in there, we as an organization do feel that it does complement. There's been Periwinkle was um, one of the first to change their streetscape um, with the way their door and their um, setback was brought forward. Actually, my father did the, um, the, the windows change there for the entrance and brought it up to the, right up to the sidewalk. So it does, and they have been very successful with that change um, on that building as a retailer, being a very successful retailer, and also made the changes in some of their other um, areas as well. But we do feel that it is uh, beneficial. We appreciate the uh, time and the talent uh, from the architect and bringing that forward. But we'll continue that vibrancy and that pedestrian flow as you come across going both um, east and west on Atlantic Avenue. And uh, the building itself is an experience. It does have history. We definitely want to keep it um, as part of our character of our community and really uh, hope that you will approve this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Um, at this point, is there? Oh, we, we have comments. Oh, well, I'm, I'm asking if there was anyone else. I didn't see anyone stepping up. So come right over and. Make your comments, huh? And just make sure that you mention that you were sworn to. Well, 
Hi, sorry. If you were sworn oh, yeah, in, I was yeah. Sworn in. Okay, yeah. name Hi. and address. Hello. Uh, my name is Nicole Fontaine, and um, I have specialized in retail leasing for. And your address. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. No problem. <laughs> uh, my address is 6959 Northwest 3rd, um, Boca Raton. <laughs> so I'm here because, um, well, again, my name's Nicole Fontaine. I've specialized in retail leasing for 12 years now. And more specifically, I am leasing this property for Steve. Um, so um, some of the feedback that I've gotten um, on this particular property is that uh, tenants are interested with this new design that they've come up with and having the visibility um, is very important to them. So at the core, I think really of each city, um, their success is their businesses. So for the longevity and sustainability of these businesses, uh, it's imperative that they have the maximum amount of exposure. That's how we can get this leased up. Um, and then lastly, I've noticed, you know, on the ad that most of the storefronts are very visible. They're upfront what we're looking for here. So we're just asking for the same kind of consideration. So thank you. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. If anybody else is in the audience that wants to come up, just go ahead and queue up. Hi, David M. Havich, 1830 Lake Drive. Uh, I'm a managing partner at Katz & Associates, where Nicole actually works. Uh, resident here in Delray. Been in the business 20 years, specializing in commercial retail real estate. So I actually represent a lot of retailers from nationals that did the two Chick-fil-A's in Delray to local boutiques, restaurants, et cetera. And I would just say, seems that, you know, we did a, a great job with Gary and uh, the um, previous lady here uh, outlining what this is really about. It seems to me is, you know, do we want to be Delray Beach continue want to be perceived as being relevant or sort of, you know, go by the wayside, kind of like Las Olas and Worth Avenue. And so the dated looks with the old facades, et cetera, that served a purpose in the time, but that's not Delray Beach. You know, I've been here since 2015. Uh, we are a young, vibrant, uh, relevant, experiential type of city, and the type of retail facade that Mr. Cohen's putting in and is already brought in by previous restaurants and retailers uh, kind of takes us to where we need to be. Um, and uh, the feedback we do get from all these guys, there's a reason why Apple, for example, is really limiting new mall deals and only focusing on glass cubes. People want to be seen. They want their merchandise to be told a story. You need to go see it as you're walking by. So filling in an extra are we talking about inches or feet, I don't think is really going to, people are going to walk by and um, create extra pedestrian space. I think it's really going to enhance the city, continue to take it where it's going. Um, you know, the feedback I get all the time when I bring clients into town is what a great city you have here. And we're sort of, what I tell people is we're the, we're the playground for Palm Beach County, and I think we're a better version of Miami in the sense that we have great restaurants, great entertainment, great nightlife without all the crazy traffic and, and everything else that has to do with everything that that's Miami has. Um, but we are lacking retail, and I think the restaurants are here, the Ray's got a really trendy boutique hotel now, and we're missing good retail. And I think uh, having the proper venue that Steve is bringing in place is going to attract the retailers today and for years to come. So those are, uh, those are my thoughts and comments. All right. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Seeing no one. Public comment is now closed. Um, is there any cross-examination uh, cross or, cross or rebuttal testimony by the staff or applicant? No. I, I would like to add something. Go right ahead. If you want, if he wants to sure. yield to him. So the only thing that I, I did do want to put on the record um, is that what's interesting to me is that I have two other waivers coming towards you to put arcades on our on Atlantic. So, and they're not for restaurants. So, you know, this idea that the market demands it, I, I don't know if I should tell them to watch the special people that were here with the expertise. The other thing that I, I do want to put out there is that when you look at Atlantic Avenue, um, almost every storefront has either an arcade or a fairly deep awning. The one building that doesn't is the one that we get the most complaints about, which was wings. the previous Wings building. Yeah. 
And then, then you factor in the Florida Building Code and the energy calcs that we need to try to reach in this day and age. And what I really don't want to see if we're removing the arcades is the next thing that goes in is reflective glass. And then Laura calls me. <laughs> and then we send code enforcement out. And you're trying to hit those energy calcs. The reality is um, big awnings, um, arcades go a lot um, towards being able to um, reach those issues without um, reflective gla glass being necessary, which when you're in an exterior environment and not in a mall, mm. um, you know, starts to actually work against the retail. So I did just want to say that on the record so that wh wherever this project goes, um, you're on notice, Gary. <laughs> so, so knows, Gary, two about. minutes, man. My comment would only be the fact I never said I don't agree with arcades. I never said they were inappropriate. I never said that they wouldn't work on Atlantic Avenue. What I said was this portion of an arcade is too deep, the proportions are wrong, and it doesn't show the storefront. So unfortunately, ours doesn't work. But I would never say no. And I'd like to believe that the one that will be presented to you tonight has probably got larger openings and more height and higher storefront class than seven feet. Thank you. Thank you. All right, to the commission. Anyone want to start? Yes, sir. Um, I'll be in favor of SPRAB and the DDA's recommendation tonight. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? I, I have nothing. Okay. Yes. I, Gary, there's one thing you missed in your 28-minute presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I find it very persuasive. I'm serious. The email I referenced was from uh, the lady who owns Morley, that safety is a concern. I People see, because I, I, I've gone in that arcade somewhere between a thousand and a million times. <laughs> I'm just, because I'm always downtown. I live downtown. People live there. They uh, use it as a restroom facility. It is uncomfortable. They, they uh, make aggressive panhandling requests. So to me, that's why I'm supporting it. Uh, obviously, you had some other points, and, and, and Thea's presentation was great as well. But to me, it uh, uh, lessens a major safety concern that we are facing in our downtown. So, uh, just going forward, I, I would highlight that. To me, that was the most persuasive thing that I saw was this email. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. It, it just because I hadn't seen it for firsthand, I didn't want to present it secondhand like that. I did make reference to a dead zone, and that's what I felt was it's dark and stuff like that. But thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Deputy Vice Mayor. It's challenging because we know the residents happen to like this arcade, even though I, I agree with a lot of what's being said. And realistically, they can take out the arcade tomorrow, mm -hmm. and we have no say whatsoever. So keeping that in mind, moving out the window slightly, I'm not really bothered by the waiver. OK. And you know, I, I I'm. I kind of like, I, I shift back and forth on this because I know that this is something that, um, you know, we are not Boca, we're not any of these other cities, we're not Miami, um, we're Delray and, and we're special. And, uh, you know, it just feels a little bit like we're slowly taking some of that away. Now, I cannot disagree, looking at the pictures, being, driving down the road, understanding exactly what is going on here, which is that it is way too, that arcade makes it very dark to see anything that's happening in those um, storefronts. And so who wants to really move in there? That just doesn't make any sense to me. So, But I, I see the renderings, and I think, gosh, that looks more like, I don't know, another, another, another city, not necessarily Delray. I'd love to see some of that. Maybe, maybe without the palm trees and the, and the shade trees are put in there, it might just take on a different look. I'm not sure, but I can't. I understand what can happen, as, as um, you know, Julie just basically said, and uh, that, that arcade can come out. I do know that we are increasing the, the, the uh, nonconformity by doing this, but at the same time, um, I'm not so sure that the recommendation of not agreeing with it is, is the right thing either. I think this is a very a unique situation. So um, it's going to have my support too. So, yeah. uh, anything else? No. Entertain a motion. Motion to approve resolution one two seven two two. Second. Call the roll, please. 
<coughs> Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? And yes. Congratulations. Good luck. Make it, look like Del Make it look like Del Rey, please, Mr. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Cohen. <laughs> All right, moving um, to 7B. We are, um, this is a approval for resolution 114-22. Mr. Dunkley, I believe, is going to be. Yep. So let everybody head out. Gosh, what a, what a group. I'm telling you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Deputy Vice Mayor, members of the Commission. The item before you is actually in contemplation of issuance of the revenue bond for the water and sewer debt issue. Mm -hmm. And so it, it essentially is, uh, it represents your declaration of reasonable intent for reimbursement of project expenditures in connection with the planning, design, and construction of the new water treatment plant. And uh, all said, what this is is a requirement by the Internal Revenue Service that if we incur expenditures prior to issuance of the debt, we have to make a formal declaration of intent that these expenditures be reimbursed out of the proceeds of the bonds. And so it's a matter of a um, formality, essentially, that we're issuing this resolution and in uh, contemplation of issuance of the debt to construct the water treatment plant. And I'm is basically available for any questions that you might have. 150 million. That is a not to exceed amount. Right. The actual sizing of the debt issue will be done around the time when they determine the guaranteed maximum price. No, I, I know. I, I think sh I, I thought you just asked me what the amount was. No. I, okay. Yeah, it's a not to exceed amount, and we we put it at that level so that we don't have to come back before you to. Um, to go back and forth with the amount. We'll size the actual debt issue when we get a better feel of the total project cost. Understood, and I think that that's still up in the air because we are Correct. now being faced with some additional, I think, um, requirements through, um, uh, I believe it was, is it? F EPA. DPA, okay. EPA. I mean, EPA, um, I was thinking D, D Department of Health, but it's right. EPA, sorry. EPA. So um, that might actually increase the price depending on how many more, uh, you know, screening uh, or filtration systems that need to be added in order to be able to get some more of those PFASs out of the water that are that are in. Um, I think we mentioned last time, and I just want to make sure that we mention it again, um, we are looking at uh, potentially joining, or we are going to be joining a class action, I guess it is, suit um, with respect to some of the companies that have um, poisoned, or I should say, put this, this, these chemicals into our water that we are now having to face taking in out. In the ground, in the ground. So in the ground. Causes yeah. in the ground. It's right. That, that flow into the water because what right. they do is they, they percolate through our, our cleaning system, which is our, our substrate or the, the soil, and, uh, and make it into our water supply. Potentially. 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 There you go. Just to clarify, this is by no means the, the resolution for right. issuance of the debt. This is just a declaration of intent. And um, the, the impetus of this is that we're about to engage the owner's representative. And in the very near future, staff will be, actually not staff, the evaluation committee mm -hmm. will be making a recommendation as to the top rank proposer for the owner's rep. And so with that in mind, we're trying to uh, get ahead of the, the train, so to speak, uh, such that we can allocate those expenditures to the de proceeds of the debt. And that's the, the, the gist of this resolution uh, this evening. Okay, very good. Commissioner Johnson? Yes, uh, why 150 million? Why not 250 million? Why um, not 175? I believe thus far this is the engineer's uh, estimate of probable cost that we have received. With an additional cushion on top of it. The, exactly. We, 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 the, the, the amount, so to speak, from, from our, for our purposes at this point, we're not constrained to this amount. This is just an approximate amount to get us over the hump such that we can 
allocate the expenditures of the owner's representative, okay. which by far will not exceed this amount. What you used to call an educated guess. Um, that I will... More or less. Uh, it, it, with, with respect to the amount, that is an engineering estimate. Okay. Uh, Yes. Very good, thank you. Uh, anything else? One thing I wanted to bring up. Over the weekend in, in Hollywood at the League of Cities, uh, Commissioner Johnson and I, we interacted with so many people from throughout the state. And one of the things that really stood out to me is how these little small cities that I've never heard of are getting millions of dollars in grants and, and mm -hmm. it just seems like they're getting things that we aren't applying for maybe or don't get or whatnot. You mean towards their like water treatment yeah. plan? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, the infrastructure, big, and in big. particular water treatment. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I would just encourage septic tanks. I mean, we'll be working to be more assertive in that area as time progresses. And quite frankly, we need to pursue these types of opportunities in order to become eligible for those. So that was one of my initial questions coming on board over the last year. There are other opportunities that can be sought, and there are specific reasons why we were not eligible. But as we continue down this path, will become more eligible for other opportunities. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I mean, would you agree with that assessment? Yes, yes I would, especially since the new infrastructure bill has been passed by the federals. Um, there's money out there. I just think we need to be more aggressive in seeking Precisely. it. Precisely. We're getting quite a lot of infrastructure money. No. We've done I'm well. talking cities in Florida with 30,000 people are getting 20 million. Right. Wow. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I can put a nice dent yeah. into well, Absolutely. Notwithstanding okay. the 20 minutes of the city of Derry Beach that's secure for Tropical and all that. Yeah. Right. So. Um, shall I make a motion? Yes. Motion please. to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. <laughs> Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Unanimous. Dunkley. Thank you. Thank you. Unanimous um, decision. Okay. Ordinance number 21-22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, rezoning seven parcels of land measuring approximately 4.3882 acres located on the east side of North Federal Highway, north of Del Mar Way, and south of Gulfstream Boulevard with addresses of 2419, 2507, 2515, 2519, 2601, 2605, and 2613 North Federal Highway from general commercial to automotive commercial as more particularly described herein. Amending the City of Delray Beach Zoning Map, July 6, 2021, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date and for other purposes, and this is second reading. Okay, very good. Hello. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Commission, Bonnie Miskell here on behalf of the petitioner. Um, so why am I here? And by the way, I think I'm gonna be a lot quicker than Gary. I just want the record to reflect that. Um, God bless you. <laughs> no one's ever fought with me when I've said that. So why are we here? Um, as you may be aware, uh, there is an existing Hyundai dealership at 655 Northeast 6th Avenue, um, south of George Bush Boulevard on the east side of Federal Highway. Um, it has been there for years. My client acquired it recently. Uh, upon acquisition and in the first couple of months of the transition, he realized very quickly that the dealership had outgrown its location there. And it was essentially busting at the seams. He then began to look and explore opportunities to move the two-acre, you know, bundle somewhere into a larger space so that they could truly serve their customers and do better in the city of Delray Beach. So that is the reason that prompted this application was, you know, outgrowing one space and hoping to find something that was better suited for their automobile dealership. And, and we believe we have done that. So we're going to get right to it. Um, the new location is on the north end of town. Um, the addresses are uh, 2419 through 2613. There are seven parcels. They are contiguous. They are very narrow parcels. Um, the, these cars are not there anymore. Uh, they were related to a prior user, um, but it is more than double the size of the space that they're in today. And this is where we hope you'll agree is much better suited for the automobile dealership and the automotive use. This is what it looks like today. As you can see, this is a perspective looking north on North Federal Highway. And this is what the future land use map um, looks like today. As you can see, all of that reddish, orangish color is the general commercial land use designation. 
This is the, the map to the left. We'll show you what our zoning is today. It is a general commercial zoning designation. On this part of town, you have a mix of GC and AC. We have an a AC, which is the Gunther dealership, um, one uh, short parcel to the south, and there are some, there's an AC to the northwest, and there's some AC also to the southwest. The proposed zoning would look as shown on the right-hand side where there would be AC just north of the Gunther, as shown in purple. And I'm just going to quickly point out, you can see what the uses are for the current AC designated locations on the map. The one on the right side is the Gunther, and there are two on the uh, northwest and uh, southwest of the site. So when you have a rezoning application, one of the first thresholds you must meet or exceed um, is compatibility and consistency with the comprehensive plan. Uh, we believe that, and the city's comprehensive plan, the Always Delray plan, actually provides a great deal of detail as, as, is, as is what is expected on the northern part of this corridor. Let me go into some of these more specifically. Okay. So um, these are some of the, and there are more provisions, but just to go over the big ones, uh, we are compatible and consistent with policy NDC 1.3.10. Use the general commercial land use designation to accommodate a wide range of non-residential and mixed-use development and limited standalone residential development along major corridors in the and certain districts within the city. Objective 2.5, recognize that automobile dealers and auto-related uses are local legacy industries within the city with unique impacts and require appropriate and strategic locations. And, and what is different with your comprehensive plan that you don't see um, by your neighbor's plans is that you actually even have locational requirements in the Always Delray plan. Typically you find those in the zoning, um, in your zoning regulations or your, your land development regulations. But you start with your comp plan and you specifically say where the areas in your cities are that are appropriate for automobile dealerships. The, our request happens to be one of those. Um, and they're primarily uh, oriented towards the northern end of the corridor, federal corridor, and the southern end of the federal highway corridor. Specifically under 2.5.1, it goes into where those uses should be, not just generally where, but specifically where. And as you can see, highlighted in yellow on the screen is the location that we are proposing today. We are on the east side of North Federal Highway. On the north end of Federal Highway, we are north of 2200 North Federal Highway. So your comp plan, your always Delray comp plan, which is not an old comprehensive plan. You mended your comp plan um, recently or fairly recently. Uh, went into specificity as to this use and among other locations, this location. So that in and of itself, we have to demonstrate that we're compatible with your land use plan. Your land use plan is telling you where it should be and this area that we have chosen happens to be where it should be. And as a matter of fact, when my client was looking for where it would be appropriate, your comprehensive plan led him exactly where he needed to go and that's where he ended up. So. Moving on. Um, and then this slide just reiterates um, the last um, uh, uh, policy showing you where the locations are within your comprehensive plan. The site that we are talking about this evening is where the number two is. You can see it in the upper right hand corner of the map. Um, the AC is appropriate on both sides of federal there. And then you can see the large swath of AC that would be acceptable is on the south end of South Federal Highway. And you have some that is on Wallace. And you have an area that is just east of 95 on Linton. So this is the map showing the areas that your comprehensive plan said are not only appropriate, but they're the preferred locations. All right, and so um, now we'll go quickly go through the rezoning criteria, but I think we demonstrated already. And by the way, your staff report um, goes into this in more detail, and Anthea may speak about it. But they have found that our request is located in one of those areas that is not only preferred, but it is a compatible area. Um, that 
under the rezoning criteria, we have to demonstrate that the requested, that one of three categories, we actually feel we qualify for two, but the one in particular, is that the requested zoning is of similar intensity as allowed under the future land use map, and that it is more appropriate for the property based on circumstances particular to the site and or neighborhood. And, and what is particular here is that your comprehensive plan denotes where you can have AC, and this area is one of those um, spe specially designated and denoted areas. The requested, and, and I'm going to go into some of the similarities of the intensity. Just mentioned, it's compatible with the objectives and the policies in the comprehensive plan. It's consistent with the general commercial land use designation, um, which talks about a wide range of commercial uses. Um, it also is shown in your table within your uh, comprehensive plan, table NDC1, specifically representing that the AC is the preferred category for the general commercial land use and in that location. Um, there are no increases in concurrency impacts for this particular use. As a matter of fact, it's a reduction in the traffic in the daily trips that would be generated by this use. Um, and it's also compatible with the zoning designation because as I showed on your zoning map, um, and, and by the way, your comp plan also talks about clustering your AC uses, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're clustering this proposed use with that that's around it, and there's a cluster on the, for, on the southern end of uh, Federal Highway as well. Um, uh, at page six of your staff, port, staff report, your staff recognizes that the rezoning to AC is compatible with the corridor, um, and, and we'll get into that a little bit that more in some of my slides. Automobile use is, is consistent and compatible with development of the entire North Federal Highway Corridor, again, in the two locations that is specifically denoted. So going straight down section 2.4.5 D2, the rezoning criteria, the first one is not applicable. Um, it, we, we, don't, we don't qualify under this. We do need, not need to respond to that. Rezoning uh, B, rezoning of the land located west of I-95. We're not west of I-95, so that's not applicable. C, zoning changes that would result in strip commercial development shall be avoided. Currently, there are seven parcels. They are seven narrow parcels. That is exactly what would be inconsistent with this section if we wanted to come in and we wanted to have se seven separate commercial uses on this site, it would be promoting strip, not the opposite. We are the opposite. We're aggregating those seven p parcels into one large, larger, I don't want to say large, but one large lot, one singular project. So we actually are compliant. And I think I'm just about done, if you'll just give me one more. Um, it talks about D, rezoning of land shall result in land uses deemed compatible with adjacent and nearby land uses both existing and proposed, or that if incompatibility may occur, that sufficient regulations exist to properly mitigate adverse impacts. Your staff report, and your probably Anthea will say to you that AC is one of the categories in your code where special regulations are enforced and contained within that category because they believe that you need to meet those in order to mitigate any negative impacts. So AC does this, and then I'm I'm pretty much done. Um, the and just to elaborate on that. AC development standards include location of where loading may be, um, that dealerships are prohibited from using residential streets for test drives, that walls are required where they are not in general commercial, the maximum light poles allowed, which we are going to be much less than, the buffer requirement is specified. Um, so, so uh, and I, I really am done. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the point is, that your comprehensive plan does something that most others do not. It tells you where AC is appropriate, and that's exactly where we've applied for. Um, we, I, uh, I know that the city of Gulfstream spoke in the last few meetings, and I would like to just share with you that we have um, met with them on, an, on a few occasions. We've talked to them on a number of occasions. They have a laundry list of things they'd like us to do. We essentially committed to the Planning and Zoning Board, which would carry over, obviously, to this meeting, 
Um, everything that we committed to in that meeting, we continue to commit to, to provide in this particular case. Uh, we also said that what we can't commit to now that needs to be tied to the site plan, we will continue to work with them and incorporate it into the site plan. There were only a handful of things that we couldn't commit to now that we may be able to commit to, but we just need time to do so. They're going to present to you, and I'd just like to reserve a few minutes after that, if I may. And that's it for us. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you'd like to. Right. We're going to go ahead and let the um, city okay. go ahead and make their report, and then we'll, we'll ask for the right, comments from the public. Um, so, Ms. Miskell is correct. We do have um, policies in our comprehensive plan that are um, very explicit related to this type of use. Um, so I'll go over that pretty quickly. We've gotten a good overview of the site. It's just over four acres. It has a general commercial land use, and the um, current zoning is GC, and the request before you is to shift that to AC. Um, there is one parcel in between the proposed dealer and the other one to the south. Um, Yes. And you've gotten a good overview of what that does to the zoning map. So let me keep moving. Um, so the location right now to the south has a uh, general commercial use, however, it's um, golf cart sales. And to the north, um, there's um, a medical office. Um, and I think ultimately, um, the issue isn't so much the federal corridor, it's, it's the transition of betting our neighbors. And so um, they're here to speak to that the potential impacts there. Um, so you are determined with um, making a finding that there is a valid reason for approving the change and the code sets forward um, what they are um, in terms of um, why the, the zoning should shift. AC is a preferred land use or zoning implementation of the GC land use, so that's not um, in conflict. Um, you've gone over concurrency um, that there would be a slight reduction with the use change from general commercial to um, AC for traffic which seems counterintuitive considering you're selling vehicles but that's what um, the traffic um, analysis tells us so this is where um, I think there's um, the focus of the presentation is is that um, the comprehensive plan has several long-standing policies related to how we handle um, you know, one of our legacy industries ultimately, which is car sales and, and full service dealerships. So we have a policy um, that we didn't focus a lot on that flat out says we are not rezoning any additional land west of I-95 to AC. So this puts us back to where we've historically had them, which is along the North Federal Highway corridor. Um, so in an effort to direct people into the, the area, again, these are long standing that they um, have to go north of George Bush Boulevard, um, and that's um, between North Federal and Dixie Highways on the east side, north of, <laughs> for very specific, the address, which shifts it so that it's not abutting any um, incompatible land uses in the city. And then the balance of them are focused on um, south of Linton Boulevard. So um, I do think it's important that while this is a rezoning. The site plan will go to SPRAB separately as a completely separate action, and everything there will be fully analyzed um, in relationship to our LDRs. The LDRs do contain, and, and Ms. Miskel went over most of them, um, a lot of safeguards related to try trying to make this use as compatible as possible with the surroundings. There's, you know, lighting. There's display limitations. Um, there's um, how far away the repair facilities have to be from any residential zoning, how far it has to be away from any, uh, the fuel the fuel pumps from residential zoning, that car washes need to be in an enclosed building, there are lighting restrictions both for the height but just ultimately how bright the property can be lit at night, um, and those would be again fully analyzed. At this point, it, the analysis is more does the size of the site meet the standards in the LDRs than it does. Um, so when we look at where these are located, um, North Federal Highway, this is the subject site. You have um, Gunther Volkswagen and Volvo to the south, and there's um, and there was another vehicle storage, and um, Mitsubishi is down here. Um, and again, this is um, 
the transition that's occurring with the Gunther dealership is very similar to what's occurring here. Um, and um, then the remaining dealers um, are located generally along South Federal Highway um, with the focus to keep them between Old Dixie and South Federal. And we do have um, the adopted neighborhood plan there discourages any future changes on the east side, which is where in our city they would start to abut potential residential. Um, I do think it's important to note that um, we do have operational issues with this type of use. And that's part of what I'm sure you're going to hear from the affected neighbors. Um, we have um, issues, um, one of the uh, new dealers to the south, the car wash, you know, acoustics are a tricky thing as we know, and the car wash is bothering one of the multifamily um, um, buildings that are next to it. Um, we've had an ongoing issue with both the temporary lots and some of the dealers with locating their keys using the FOBs because you want to buy the green one and so what's the fastest way to find the green one is the guy that's running out to get the green one sets the alarm off to find it quickly now i un i understand technology is changing but you know this strip of commercial does have neighbors and you have to be careful operationally um, we have um, some of the other ones that are parked in structures um, the people who work there drive the cars really quickly down the ramps and so I was I, I, I'm joking but like it's when you go really? to Greece we're going around the mountain really fast so we beep the horn the whole time so somebody knows you're coming around right we can't be moving cars in a business on a daily basis using the horns so this is very difficult for us to enforce over time because when code enforcement goes out not they're not clicking it so um, the use does have to be very carefully, I think, um, designed for the site plan, which is a job for SPRAB, but also operationally to ensure that compatibility that is one of the findings for this type of rezoning is there. Um, and uh, this is nothing against this applicant. I mean, we are supposed to be evaluating the use of the zoning itself. I really don't even know which dealer it is. I, I didn't read the file that, that in depth because it doesn't matter because once the zoning is there, it could be any dealer for that use. So that's the way to look at it. Um, and the details really, if this, if this rezoning is successful, need to be um, kind of worked out through the SPRAB report or through the SPRAB action, which will appeal, which will appear on an agenda here as an appealable. So that's the way to watch the implementation of it. In terms of the standards for the rezoning, um, several of the standards do not apply at all. Um, that will the rezoning result in a strip commercial? Um, auto dealers really are their own animal. They're not strip commercial. Um, there are some. There is some guidance with the North Federal Highway, Highway Redevelopment Plan about the location of buildings, and then also that the rezoning to AC, um, whether or not it is deemed to be compatible with adjacent and nearby land uses, both existing or proposed. Um, and while there's compatibility along the city's corridor, you know, the potential impact to our neighbors across that municipal line, I think, are, is really the subject of the concerns that you're going to hear tonight. Um, so ultimately, um, this proposal went to the Planning and Zoning Board um, on June 20th. It was recommended for approval 6 to 1. And um, of course, the first reading moved through previously, and so now it's here before you for second reading and final action. So that concludes. I'm here if you have any questions. Right, very good. So at this point in time, this is a public hearing. Anybody who's interested in speaking to Ordinance 21 22, please step forward, state your name. Mayor, can I make a quick sure. request? Just because I know that we have individuals that aren't used to coming to our city commission meetings, if we can just get a quick explanation of the first reading 5 0. Oh, I'm sorry. Because of our process. I think that's important. Yeah, so our first, our oh, first okay. reading, essentially, yes. there's no presentation. So the commission is basically tasked with deciding if it's going to move to a second reading for further consideration. And this is the first time, actually, the commission's getting a presentation on this matter. Correct. We don't ever get a presentation on a first reading. It's just to move it forward and then get the explanation on the second reading. So state your name and address, and then you'll have three minutes. Um, do you 
Oh, you want me to start? <coughs> this is uh, Mr. Nazaro. He's a city attorney for Gulfstream. Oh. Um, he has oh, requested six minutes because he's representing right. the town, and I think it's it's a fair request. Mm -hmm. And do you require applicant uh, speakers to be sworn? Because I think a few people no. are not here. Okay, yeah. I didn't think so, but just wanted to clarify. Uh, for the record, Trey Nazaro, on behalf of the town of Gulfstream, I would like to acknowledge Mayor Scott Morgan is here in the audience as well as uh, Gulfstream Town Manager Greg Dunham. So I want to thank them uh, for their appearance here. This is a very important uh, issue for our city. Uh, the first slide you can see, that that's, that's your look from the street. So you see rooftops. I mean, it's not that deep a lot. It is a, a small size, and it has this potential to significantly impact single-family residential properties that share a common border. Uh, Ms. Miskell in the, uh, uh, in the city mentioned uh, the city code and the LDRs. We need to prove that this rezoning is more appropriate for the property based upon circumstances particular to the site. And the applicant has said, well, it's in the city's comp plan. This is one of the areas that are specifically designated. Just rubber stamp it. It's totally fine. Well, I would put it to you that when we actually look at those five areas, none of them, like this one does, border even residential, not only single family residential, but any residential without some sort of progressive zoning. Uh, so again, the always Delray comp plan that I believe both of them had mentioned, automotive dealerships are lo local legacy industries that have unique impacts that require appropriate and strategic locations. So the question is, is this an appropriate and strategic location based on the border to uh, a single family residential? So the staff, uh, based on my comments from the last meeting, went through and, and with a fine tooth comb, looked and saw what do we have in the city that borders any residential whatsoever. And there are four areas, only four. So the first one obviously is Gunther, nine and a half acres. Still significant issues bordering a single family residential property. Again, a common border. And of course, we're looking at this property is only 4.3 acres, so it's less than half the size. If you look at the northernmost lot that's highlighted in red, that's something like 220, 250 feet deep. That is very, very shallow compared to what we have at Gunther, which is over twice the length. The existing issues that we have have resulted in code enforcement being called. It's a drain on city, uh, city resources to, to place something like this that's incompatible. <coughs> and does have a negative impact on the city. So I put to you that there are a lot of complaints that I receive, but in the end, I don't have any ability to address concerns that are happening in the city. So uh, again, moving along the lines, we have the second one, Kia Del Rey, which is on the left, which has a, a fairly large street, and then multifamily. So that there, again, there's no common border, and there is some transitional zoning before you get to actual single family residential. And on the right, you have Grico Mazda, which uh, does have an alleyway, and then a very small area, common border, on the, the bottom right there, with, with, where there's no building. It's really just nothing but a parking lot. So there's really minimal nuisance there. Uh, Greco Chevrolet, again, bordering, but a very large street. So there's a natural buffer that is geography, and again, multifamily, not single family. Going to number four, presidential auto sales. So it's only a one acre lot, it's not a large dealership, but it was the fourth location in the entire city that has anything that's an AC zone area bordering residential. Again, Nothing that's single family. We have transitional zoning and we do have streets in between. So if you look at the city of Delaware Beach zoning districts, you'll see single family residential in the yellow. And then of course you have the commercial in red. So the always Delaware policy stated that we should accommodate these uses in these specific five areas. So accommodate, I looked it up. It's to provide something desired, needed, or suited. So the question is, when you look at these, this accommodation, is do you desire do you need or is this suited, this specific location? And I would put to you no. The first area is between George Bush and Federal, in between two highways. On the one side where there's a potential for uh, impact to the single family, you have Dixie Highway and railroad tracks. So you have a significant natural buffer. Skipping uh, to number three, again, south of Linton between Federal and Dixie. Again, you have natural buffers. Look at that zoning map. You do not see yellow next to red. You don't. There's transitional zoning. Again, moving on to number four, this is, these are the items within the comp plan. 
that suggests that you should accommodate, where is the yellow? It's on the other side of the orange, which is the multifamily. And also a street there in between. And then and the last one along Wallace Drive, again, transitional zoning. You have your AC, you have your multifamily, and then you have your yellow. Yellow is not next to red, except for in Gulfstream, your border here, which if you look to the right, everything with those streets is technically yellow. It's single family, residential. So we just say that that is why the strategic location should not be in, in this area. Is it desired, is it needed, or is it suited? I would put to you again, that is a drain on city services. Um, just as a, a little background, this property is going to sell if you deny this. So, some, some use will be put to it. I think there was a public comment last month by one of your residents that said, we should just keep it general commercial and see what happens. And I think I was here last week about something else. I feel like I'm here more than I'm in my Gulfstream meetings, actually. Um, <laughs> mentioned that if we, don't, if we don't take action on this property, something else will happen. And, and my, I put to you, something else will happen. This is a beautiful property. You have the, the entrance to Delray. And do we want it to be car dealerships or do we want it to be something nice? So thank you very thank much. You. Sir. Good evening, my name is Rob Canfield, 2770 Cardinal Circle. I'm also a member of the uh, Board of the Homeowners Association for the Town of Gulfstream. Uh, I'm sorry, for the Plaza Soleil and a member of the ARPB for the Town of Gulfstream. So I do have a little bit of appreciation of what you guys are going through with the decision making for a process like this. Um, we did notice that this application was time to take advantage of the summer months due to the vacations and sometimes the lack of attention that these issues can get um, during the summer. Um, because of this, the HOA has not been able to engage in proper representation due to some of these schedules. It's also worth noting that the applicant did not seek out the HOA. In fact, it was just the opposite. Our HOA had detailed our concerns and how to address them. The applicant chose to delay communications by hampering our ability to respond appropriately. Initial communication back in March stated that there would be no concerns uh, with some of the conditions that we were proposing until we asked for it in writing. Um, only after address they're only addressing these conditions um, with the stipulation that we provide a letter of support. That's a letter from the town of Gulfstream and from our homeowners association supporting this project. I uh, wanted to address some of the concerns that uh, we had with this letter that the applicant sent to us dated August 11th, which is best described as somewhat disingenuous along with the conditions that they are committing to. First, we had request, requested a planted buffer area of 20 feet. The applicant has offered 10 feet which I understand is within the code. My wingspan is eight feet. So if we go just a few, a foot beyond each, each one of my fingertips there, that's not nearly enough of a buffer for a project of this size. Uh, for reference, the Volvo dealership is 35 feet. Again, due to the size and configuration of this lot, a 48 foot building height, which I know is per code, is excessive given the proximity to a neighborhood where the max height is 22 feet with most houses far below that. Additionally, when the applicant builds a garage with only 12 foot light standards, as stated, they are now 60 feet above the neighborhood with lighting. If we do get to this point, the top deck lighting should be wall mounted and not on 12 foot standards. There's other issues that we've discussed with the key fobs. Um, we've seen that with Gunther already. Uh, there's a, a commitment to make the service garage climate controlled. Um, we understand that that could go down and the doors would have to be open, but we do really desire that those service doors be oriented to the west so any of the noise or noise pollution that comes from those aren't going into our neighborhood. Uh, finally, there's going to be no trash pickup on the east side of the property. This must occur, and this must occur during normal business hours, and this would also include the hazardous materials such as used oil. Uh, in closing, due to the configuration of the lot and all the necessary considerations, we're seeking a denial of this zonal change. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. I have pictures, so I'm not going to hurt my little finger doing the clicker thing. Good evening. Ingrid Kenimer, uh, 760 Southeast Fifth Avenue, and also a resident of Place House LA. Uh, in the 1990s, the neighborhood and the CRA got together and in the Delray Way and held charrettes, in which I participated. And the North Federal Highway Redevelopment Plan was created and adopted by the city and the city commission on March 1999 was, I'm sorry, was adopted um, to serve the will of the people for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The plan included 
a market demand analysis. The CRA and the City of Delray Beach Planning and Zoning Department envision the redevelopment of the North Federal Highway area to, to include a mix of uses, particularly retail, office, light, office, light, industrial, and residential. This does not say automotive. Another section, the depth of commercial development. The depth of most commercial properties in the North Federal Highway area is limited by existing residential neighborhoods, roads, and railroad right-of-ways. Commercial developers must make every effort to provide sufficient buffers to ensure compatibility with existing residential areas. I can tell you from experience, 10-foot buffer is not enough with automotive use. As time and progress in our city continue, the neighbors and the CRA came together again with the South Federal Highway Plan, mostly to deal with the car dealerships and their impacts, the same Delray Way with charrettes and meetings. In 2012, the South Federal Highway Redevelopment Plan was created and adopted by City Hall and the Commission to serve the will of the people for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The plan specifically stated automotive commercial district provides for sale, lease, rental of automobiles, trucks, boats, recreation vehicles, and motorcycles. These automotive uses have a number of potential impacts on adjacent residential developments, such as test driving on residential streets, offloading vehicles, noise impact from car alarms, music, loudspeakers, mechanical equipment, nighttime glare from high levels of lighting and lighting during late hours of the evening. For this reason, AC zoning is more appropriate on the west side of Federal Highway. Oh, wait, on South Federal Highway plan, it says we should put AC zoning on the west side of Federal Highway to so we've learned from 11, uh, from 99 to 2012, we've learned the impacts of, of the automotive use against residential. Mrs. Miskell tells us that the parcel directly west of the site, and this is where my pictures come in, is also zoned AC and therefore is a precedent to giving the AC to the site tonight. What she does not talk about is the rest of the story, that her client owns that parcel and purchased it on the same day she par they, par they purchased the Acura dealership. That parcel is 3.2 acres. They also have control of the next 1.7 acres to the north, giving them just under five acres on the west side of Federal Highway on north, in the north area. Uh, that's included in my little pictures. Why does the applicant, can okay, I have I another finish, minute? Finish the, no, not a minute. You can finish your sentence. Can I yield somebody else's time? No, you have to have six people to do. Okay, so if you pass this tonight, we will have three roads coming into the city of Delray Beach, Linton Federal and North Federal Highway. There will be autos, autos, and autos, and what an image. Please understand that they're telling you that they need this parcel. They said that they went out and looked for a parcel as soon as they bought the dealership and couldn't figure it out. They actually bought this parcel the same day that they bought the parcel that they're coming from. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Yes, sir. Hi. Good evening, Mayor and, and City Commissioners. My name is Sam Perlman. I'm a resident of Place of Soleil. My home, 800 Tangerine Way, is located directly behind the parcel in question, and I'm vehemently opposed to rezoning from general commercial to automotive commercial. My concerns are included but not limited to the excessive noise and light pollution that is specific to AC zoned spaces, which will adversely affect our community quality of life community that has been in existence for over 50 years. The potential for setting uh, precedents at this meeting, which could severely impact the quality of life for current and future residents of Delray as this city continues to embark on its exciting and rapid expansion. First topic, noise. The noises you just heard are just a couple examples of the unpleasant and aggravating sounds that come with the AC zoning. Employees often use key fobs and car alarms, alarms to locate cars on the lot. The service department is constantly opening and closing large clunky garage doors and is con and in continuous use of industrial grade power tools. Since the dealerships are open 10 to 11 hours a day and seven days a week, our community would be subject to this cacophony of clanks and beeps on a continuous basis. These issues are not theoretical. Our neighbors located behind the existing Gunther de dealership deal with these issues on a daily basis. On top of that, Gunther has a, a 30 plus foot area of landscape buffer. The current owners have only agreed to 10 feet, which is a bare minimum uh, according to the zoning code. That's one third the distance of an, exi of an existent equivalent structure that has been proven to cause issues. Therefore, by definition, the impact on our quality of life 
could be three times as disruptive. Second topic, light pollution. Car dealerships must remain well lit. Using bright lights attracts customers, presents a favorable impression of the space, displays inventory, and disincentivizes theft. It's crucial for a dealership's success. As a result, these lights remain lit for extended periods of time and are rarely turned off. The unintended consequence is, in, is these lights don't just stop at the end of the lot. That light spills into our homes at all hours affecting our sleep. This again is not theoretical. The lights from Gunther, which is over two football fields away from the Kenimers, light up their bedroom at all hours of the night. A structure much closer that abuts a larger portion of single-family homes would have a significantly larger adverse effect. Finally, the third topic, setting precedent. This decision holds consequences. AC zone properties do not abut single-family residential in Delray Beach without significant or natural buffers. As Delray develops and expands, other requests may look to this ruling to approve future projects that can and will impact the lives of its residents. Hastily approving this request without further information regarding a site plan and or provisions to create an environment that's favorable for all parties could lead to issues regarding the quality of life for all citizens of Delray. I implore you to not be bullied by the current landowner owner, and to please either deny or defer, do you mind if I finish? Right ahead. Finish the rezoning time. request. Thank you very much for your Thank time. Thank you. Sir. Oh, Ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Shana Ostrovitz. I'm actually Sam's wife, and I live also at 800 Tangerine Way, right behind the parcels in question. You could actually see my roof and my backyard for most of those pictures. So I'm here to oppose the rezoning of the parcels from general commercial to automotive commercial. This rezoning will not only create severe negative impacts on our quality of life, but will also set a bad precedent for similar projects proposed in Delray. It has been very disturbing to hear of the proposed change zoning and consider a car dealership right behind our home. To be more specific, a car dealership will be right behind my backyard, my bedroom, my kitchen, and my life. In your staff's presentation about this request, it was stated, and I'm gonna read verbatim, consideration of impacts from potential automotive use should be given to ensure the adjacent neighbor's quality of life is not compromised or diminished as a result of this request. So I hope you genuine, genuinely consider the following negative impacts on our quality of life. The biggest concerns include, as you've already heard, have heard the noise from key fobs and car alarms going off all day, the use of industrial grade power tools, the garage doors that open and close all day, seven days a week. The next issue is lights. And as you know, with car dealerships, as you've heard, the lights are massive and don't get turned off. The light spillage will make our homes feel like daytime all of the time. This is something we've already learned from the Gunther dealership and already impacts our community. Other issues we know that come with dealerships that are about to our neighborhood include car delivery times, dumpster pickups, and pollution issues from gas and oil spills that come from working on motorized vehicles. And it is important to point out, which you've already heard, that it is, is impossible to address this and getting code enforcement to stop these issues is almost impossible and it's a bad use of your staff's time and energy. The negative impacts we see in our neighborhood and the inability of code enforcement to stop the issues for this property leads us to believe the rezoning will be the same, if not significantly worse than what we've already seen with the Volvo dealership considering the size of the lot you're considering today. We've already heard the limitations the applicant has around buffers and lighting, which makes it clear that there will be these negative impacts on our lives. They have only agreed to the bare minimum of the zoning codes, which would put their property just 10 feet away from my backyard. And again, Volvo has over 30. Just to give you a better idea, if you look from maybe these front seats to where you're sitting today, Mayor, that's maybe 10 feet. So I think we can all agree that's too short of a distance. And it is clear that you cannot assure that our quality of life will not be compromised or diminished as a result of this rezoning. And if this request gets approved, you're setting the precedent that will allow for similar rezoning requests that could negatively impact all residents of Delray. Therefore, I urge you to vote against this rezoning of the parcels and against negatively impacting the peaceful place we call home. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. My name is Malcolm Murphy. I've been a resident of Plaza Soleil for 20 plus years. I live at 815 Tangerine Way, which is within 200 feet of the footprint we are considering for rezoning, or you're considering for rezoning. Uh, I'm also chair of the Gulfstream ARPB. So 
as per my colleague on the board, we know what you're being faced with. I hope everything you've heard today, the noises, the fobs, all those in the weeds items, please take the bigger view. This has to be a large development to be economically viable. We've already heard it this evening. I'm quickly retracted, but yes, it's large. It's a large, imposing business. What I ask you to consider is the overall noise and the overall light. It comes from many points, and we can really delve down into it, but when the summation of that is that it adversely impacts the quality of life and diminishes the very day-to-day -day existence of the adjoining single-family homes. So that's what I'm asking you for. Please consider the big picture. Yes, you've heard everything else. I have no intention of repeating it because there's been an awful lot of hard work put into presenting a real case of why, and I'm now summarized, is we're asking you to deny this application. Please, think about it in the bigger picture. You've heard the intricate details of supporting that statement, but please think about endless light, endless noise, as we've already heard, it opens seven, if, this, if a facility comes in, and if it came in as it's a car dealership, okay, you could try and mitigate, because these problems are recognized, because the very term mitigation means that we have to try and address them. But now imagine if someone says, our dealership didn't work, I'm going to open a Harley Davidson operation. That is what we are facing. And also, because reference has already been made to the Gunter and Volvo existing operations, we've been at meetings where they have professed to do everything but give us winning lottery tickets. But in reality, the theory didn't match the practice. And that is the fear, genuine fear, that I have, and I'm here I'm speaking for myself, because of the enormity of this facility that would be going into that space if this zoning request is approved. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is closed to the commission. Anyone want to start? Yeah. Um, okay. I'll, Mr. Boylston. I'll, I'll jump in. So first I would just like to note that um, this is a legacy uh, industry in Delray Beach and that we are, we all have been very supportive. As a matter of fact, we've been so supportive that we've allowed them to, the uh, industry to store cars on lots that aren't even zoned appropriate, you know, appropriately for, for their use, temporary. Uh, but we've been very supportive of them in many different ways. Um, statements like car, de car dealerships, would you rather have car dealerships or something nice? Well, in Delray Beach, car dealerships are something nice. We're very proud of our car dealerships. We're very proud of the jobs that they, they bring. Um, so that's, that's not the, the Delray Beach way. But what I will say is, at no time have I seen any plans um, or any documents that say we should expand the footprint of car dealerships in Delray Beach. We should be supportive of the footprint that is currently here, which we have been. Many of them have been redone over the last few years. And I would say we have probably the best um, dealership corridor um, of any city I've ever seen before. But we have not seen, I've not seen anything from staff around our plans to say we should expand it. Um, I've been um, very clear with the applicant. Um, they do own other properties. And if those properties um, were no longer zoned for, for car sales, well, then there would be a change in circumstances. Um, and then I would be able to review something like this, but that hasn't happened. Um, so I will not be in favor um, of this rezoning tonight, and those are some of the reasons. Um, but obviously, if circumstances did change and there was an opportunity to re um, where there was less footprint of our automotive dealerships in Delray Beach and removed from other areas that do back, and by the way, I look at multifamily just as important as single family. So. I saw the list of uh, dealerships that back single family. Well, there's also other dealerships that um, back multifamily that I count just as important. 
Um, so if circumstances change, I'd be able to look at that, but they haven't. So I will not be in favor of this rezoning tonight. Commissioner um, Johnson? Uh, I'd like to pass if I may. No, no, that's fine. Down to this end, uh, Vice Mayor? Deputy Vice Mayor? <laughs> Where did Anthea go? Is Anthea still here? <laughs> it's funny, we, we don't have the barriers anymore, so I have more vision, but you were behind I know, the monitor. Is that funny? <laughs> Anthea, you guys look really close now. I know. <laughs> I used to not be able to ever see this way or that way. Now I can see clearly. Yay. Here's my question, Anthea. <laughs> Thank yes. you. And I recognize the, the nice folks from Gulfstream that came out, and yes. I'm guessing they came to the planning and zoning meeting. Uh, yes. Am I right? Not the planning and zoning board voted six to one to approve it. They did. Uh, that's a, a big vote by the planning and zoning board. Normally they're four three. You know, they're, they're usually or denial. Right. Explain to me what happened yeah. at the planning and zoning. Um, if you if you know. <laughs> Um, okay, let me remember because I don't want to mix up all my Bonnie Miskell applications. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, so I, I do think that there are other um, policies that are less uh, direct that do weigh in this, and there maybe it's a more nuanced re review as well. So, for example, in your staff report, which gives more more. Um, um, analysis policy NDC. 1.1.14 says that we should require that property be developed or redeveloped in a manner that the use intensity are appropriate in terms of um, soil typographic physical considerations that we encourage the affordable goods and services and then this one too are complementary to and compatible with adjacent land uses and fulfill the land use needs so i i think that while we do have policies that say don't put any of them west. Keep some of them in these areas. I don't think that that direct policy negates one of the very first policies in the land use plan, which is that we really do need to ensure compatibility, whether we're doing it through zoning or through a combination of zoning and site plan um, techniques, because these come into play with that too. Um, I'm going to turn to see. Usually, so I have a slide may, that there, says what the planning and zoning board said. Usually, and I'm trying to find it. So. so, let me ask you a question on just on what you just said. So, what you're saying is, is that their compatibility is specifically strictly with what's happening on, I would imagine, Federal Highway and the neighboring the neighboring um, uh, uh, automotive than it would be on what they're backing to. Is that what well, you're saying? Well, it's adjacent land uses, and so when you share a property line, whether you're in our city or you're our neighbors. It is something to take into consideration, right. and I do appreciate very much um, Commissioner Boylston's comments because um, I actually think it's even more problematic when they're backing directly up to multifamily because then there's more households affected mm -hmm. than when it's single family, right? So, you know, I, I think that, that that actually does matter as well, and we have um, a lot of areas to the south where that does happen. Um, okay, so the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, they recommended approval. I actually don't have the detail as to why, and I don't want to go off my memory because it's getting worse every day. Can, can, <laughs> can you help me? <laughs> Remind me? Well, don't go too far because I'm going to add another question. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the, we went through the 11 proffers that we were committed to, and we offered uh, an agreement form to the community, and it was essentially um, everything that they had first asked for. And, and by, by the way, I just want to correct, we met with them in March. We met with them again before planning and zoning board. We've had numerous conversations, but our first meeting was with Gulfstream um, at Gulfstream City Hall. And there was a member from the HOA there. And I even asked a specific question, do I need to extend um, beyond you? And he, he, the, the response was, we're gonna work with you. We have, the, we have the HOA rep here. But essentially the chair probably said it best he looked at the con the conditions that we were agreed that we had agreed to that we were willing to self-impose upon the project and looked at what their concerns were and said basically you know they're willing to work with you they've already given you you know 90 percent of what you asked for and the balance of the points that they were making we just asked for them to give us the time to get the site plan finished 
that we were negotiating with Hyundai, which by the way, we still are, they have to approve the site plan before we can even come to you. So we said, let us go through the site plan process. We will be your partner in the site plan process. We will do everything we can do to make you happy, subject to a few things, subject to the manufacturer, subject to your city code, subject to your building code, subject to the decisions of the bodies that are gonna be reviewing it. But we agreed to apply for a variance. Who does that? We agreed to build a berm and then put an eight foot wall that requires a variance on the berm so that it could go up to 10. We exceeded everything that Gunther had proffered that they supported with one exception. You saw the difference between the depth of Gunther and the depth of this site. We couldn't give a 30 foot buffer. We said, we'll give you at least a 10 foot buffer, but, but again, during the site plan process, let us work with you. And where we can expand it, we will expand it. If it can be 50 feet, it'll be 50 feet. But you just have to give us the time and let us work and collaborate with you so that we can all get to the finish line. And so, you know, Mr. Davies recognized that what was being proffered was a lot. It was more than probably I've ever seen or had any other client of mine ever put on the table and felt like we were in earnest trying to mitigate any potential impacts. Um, and, and you know, some of them included imposing a digital system so that the fobs are no longer needed. You know, just like I have a system in my purse when I lose my purse, I know where it is on my phone, I find it, it's within two feet of where it shows. So we have, we have moved into the 21st century and we are willing to impose whatever technical measures we can to be the best neighbor possible. But let us go through that process with you and come out at the end. And by the way, you have the ability to determine after the site plan is approved whether we have done appropriate mitigation. Because you can always say, you know what, I don't think you did, and call us up and you can, you can challenge our approval on that basis. That's the difference between AC and GC. GC, they meet the code, they're done. We actually have to demonstrate that we have done all appro taken all I mean, appropriate measures. I think measures. we're just wanting you to answer the question. Thank and you. I'm sorry, about but that, but, but but the chairman focused on the, the amount of offers it. and how he believed that it was. Can, a real I, can I say something to that? Yes. I just want to I just want to speak to that and respectfully, and I have all the respect for Ms. Miskell. But you know, if I had been at that meeting. I don't know how far into we would have gotten into contractual dealings with another municipality at this process. The, w right now, this is a rezoning, mm -hmm. right? You're just determining if this is compatible with our comp plan, if it's if it's an appropriate use. That's all that's before you. So for that even to have been discussed at that level, I would actually say that's almost it's it's not appropriate because you're not at the site plan review process. And again, and I tell you this all the time, what's before you, mm -hmm. you know, the promises that are made, they're not bound to. Is it in their best interest to keep the promise? Of course. But we shouldn't get bogged down in those promises because what's here, it doesn't include that. And I think we have to be mindful of that. So, you know, while I appreciate what the Planning and Zoning Board did, I don't know how, how much they should have gone into that because I don't, I don't think it's relevant. Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. If I, I could, um, and I asked Alexis Rosenberg, who's the project manager for this, to, to, to jump down, um, because they did have some other comments, and she was the one in chambers, so it'd, it'd be better if I think she tells you what they were thinking. Hello, yes, Alexis Rosenberg, senior planner for the record. Um, yes, so I was at the planning and zoning uh, board meeting as well, so I just wanted to add um, some other comments by the board members, was that they were more open to seeing what the SPRAB board uh, can further, I'm trying to think of the words, but further uh, or create less impacts on the residential neighborhood to the east. And they focused more on the idea of the potential impacts of other uses that could come in with the, under the current zoning district of GC. So they were just trying to compare the impacts both from GC uses versus what could possibly come in under AC. So I just want to let you know that was comments that were made as well. Right. Thank you. you and that was, so goes into my second question. Comments about what could come under GC, so mm -hmm. which. Well, an impact. I think that's yeah. the biggest concern. Mm -hmm. but as a kid, I remember going somewhere down around there. I don't know if it's the exact location, mm -hmm. but there was a huge flea market there. And there was about yes. a thousand cars that went in and out every day. I don't remember if it's the exact property, but it's definitely in the no. area. No, it was no. it was actually um, North. yeah. Do okay. you remember that? No, one? south of there, I think. Oh, really? yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was and it was it didn't back to those um, houses. It it sided to maybe some of them on the back okay. side. Okay, I just would think that would be a bigger impact. So, 
I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. You know, originally I was very supportive of this, and I and I am, but I, I, I share their concerns. I mean, if I lived in a house and then all of a sudden there's going to be an auto dealership behind, you don't, you know, you purchase knowing what you abut, but you have certain expectations, and we're changing that, and that, that concerns me. And to your point, which is, and, and I, I apologize because I, I really was, not opposed to this before, but now I'm struggling. We make this determination regardless of how the feelings are in the future. When it comes, it goes through SPRAB and back to us. What What is our ability besides maybe asking them to modify? We can't undo this. It's, it would come before as an appealable to the site plan. So it's, it right. would go before SPRAB. It would be. They would approve the site plan or, you know, it's, it's, it'll come before you as a site plan. And right. at that point, you can decide how to mitigate the impacts and things like that. Right, so. and so because you don't have the 30 feet to give them, what could we modify, right? And I, I do appreciate, I think it sounds like you're doing a lot, and I'm, I'm really I'm interested to hear the other comments, but the berm, the wall, it sounds like you're doing your best, but I just am not 100% sure it would be good enough. And has there been talk of... I know we're not even supposed to talk of the details. We won't. Forget it. Okay. So, <laughs> so I do want to say just in terms of the findings that SPRAB will make, let's start with that, right? We're not going to talk about how you resolve yes. it. The same, um, when you are developing something that is a class three, four, or five, so any kind of significant development, and this, there's no application at this point that I'm aware of, um, but there's a lot of applications, so they don't, I don't have all of them on my radar. Um, but um, ultimately, this will fall under that. Class threes, fours, and five require the findings that take you back to the comp plan. So the same standard that I'm saying about your ensuring adjacent mm -hmm. um, compatibility with your adjacent land uses would apply to the site plan. How they achieve that is not for the rezoning. That's for the site plan action. Right. right. Which again, if that has not been achieved, does appeal to this board um, either through, you know, and, and, and sure. that would give us an opportunity for us to show you our overall plan. Okay. Only when okay. we're asking right. a question. But I guess the um, point is, isn't how, but it, it, is it possible, right? Because if it's not possible, there's no point in pursuing. Okay. You, you don't know what's possible yet, right? right. So exactly. I, I don't even think that conversation should be had. I think we have to stick to the findings that are, I agree. you know, for this rezoning and whether or not it's compatible and you think it's appropriate. Right. So I, I really think we need to digress from Thank that you. site plan because it's... Thank you. Okay, Commissioner um, with Johnson. That, with that being said, I'm going to be very brief. Um, unfortunately, abutting a commercial zone opens you up to all kinds of possibilities without any assurance as to what it's going to be. If I'm overstepping what we're discussing, uh, please stop me. Um, why I feel for the homeowners who may have purchased their properties how many years ago, um, no one shielded the fact or hit the fact that you were abutting a commercial zone with all kind of possibilities. Um, therefore, I would be in favor of the applicant. Okay. And where I'm coming from is I, I, I have to tell you I where you are, um, <laughs> uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. Um, I supported it, um, but uh, the the, the um, it was before I really knew all the details, which have come out tonight, that uh, make me now question whether or not I can move forward with this and say yes. And here's the reason why: we have in our own uh, that was that was ex expressed tonight in our own um, comp plan um, that we're moving away from allowing for automotive that would abut our own uh, residential uh, down on the south side it's over now on the west side so that it is not going to impact any longer uh, any more than it already is um, our own homes and that's for a reason it's because it is a problem and it has been a problem, and it is a nuisance. And um, we have complaints that have been filed for the, the very um, auto dealership that we sat up here and approved in the past that basically made promises not necessarily being kept. We, otherwise, we wouldn't be having the complaints. 
So it's up to us as a body to determine, does this work there? Not just because it's on a list of, you know, of, of um, zones that, that would, would comport to that particular section of our town, because it may actually work across the street on the west side, but not on the east side. And so just because it's listed out doesn't necessarily mean that's what you're going to get if someone asks for it. It's our job to make the determination as to whether or not it fits. And I have to tell you, in, it's very compelling. It doesn't fit for me. The property is too small in order to be able to accommodate the type of noise that's going to be made here and also the lighting. You have to have the lighting for sure. Even if you mitigate the noise, you will have the lighting. And so from my perspective, it just doesn't fit. So I am not gonna support it. And I was coming in to support it. So there you go. So if there's nothing more, we can um, make a motion and- uh, Motion to deny ordinance number 21-22. Second. All the roll, please. Mr. Walston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. No. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. No. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Sorry. Moving on to 8B, ordinance number 23-22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.3, District Regulations, General Provisions, Section 433, Special Requirements for Specific Uses, Subsection K, Home Occupations, renaming the subsection to Home-Based Business, and amending regulations to comply with Florida Statute Section 559.955, repealing Section Subsection KK, Home Tutorial Services to comply with Florida Statute Section 559.955, amending Article 4.4, .4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.1, Agricultural Zone District, su Section A, to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home-based business, amending Section 4.4.2, Rural Residential RR Zone District, to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home-based business, amending Section 4.4.3, Single Family Residential R1 Districts, to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home-based business, and then repealing of Section 4.3.3, KK, amending Section 4.4.5, Low Density Residential RL District to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home based business and the repealing of Section 433KK to remove a dupl duplicative reference to home occupations now referred to as a home based business. And then Section 4.4.6 Medium Density Residential RM District to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home based business and the repealing of Section 433KK, amending subsection 4.4.7 Plan Residential. Development PRD District to reflect the renaming of home occupation home based business. Amending section 4.4.13 Essential Business CBD District. Table 4.4.13 allow Allowable Uses and Structures in the CBD Subject Districts to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home based business. Amending section 4.4.17. Residential Office RO District to reflect the renaming of home occupation to home based business. Amending Section 4.4.24 Old School Square Historic Arts District OSHAD to reflect the renaming of home occupation home based business. Amending Article 4.6 Supplemental District Regulations Section 4.6.7 Signs Table 4.6.7A Sign Standards per Zoning District. To clarify that when uses or development types have specific sign regulations, the standards in Table 467A shall not apply providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. It's the second reading. Wow. <laughs> okay. A deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever's in that, uh, yeah. you know, uh, oh, that, that yeti there. there. <laughs> Never seen you bring that to a commission <laughs> I think we're all getting a little crazy up here because we're tired. It's, it's been, been since 1.30 we've been sitting in these seats straight through. So this is a city initiated amendment um, basically based um, on a change to Florida statutes that preempts local government's ability to regulate certain uses. So um, ultimately, um, we are not allowed to enact an ordinance or take any action that would regulate a home-based business um, in certain ways. We do maintain the ability to regulate them in, in, in certain ways other ways like um, we um, for example we are requiring business tax receipts still 
Um, we are allowed to restrict uh, the number of employees. Um, it is imperative that the home-based business is clearly secondary to the primary use as a residential structure. Um, the city is allowed to limit the employees um, to um, someone who resides in the dwelling and then have up to two um, employees um, who may live elsewhere and then I don't think there's any limit on the number of remote employees. Parking, appearance, um, signage, things like that and ultimately um, in terms of, of how we might need to be concerned about our neighbors we are able um, to regulate any equipment or processes that create noise, vibration, heat, smoke, dust, glare, fumes, or noxious odors than what would otherwise be expected in a residential neighborhood. If something does not pass out litmus test, it does not qualify as a home-based business. Otherwise, um, everything else is allowed. So to do this, we had to go through the zoning code, um, obviously rename um, home occupations to home-based business. Um, there were some du duplicative issues like home tutoring and things like that that would all kind of be captured under that change. And so that's why you see a really big ordinance to do what is relatively a very simple thing. Um, so we are streamlining our businesses. Um, this um, ordinance did go before the Planning and Zoning Board. It had a recommendation of approval five to two. Um, the board was universally, um, I think, frustrated at the continued intrusion by the state of Florida into our ability to regulate our local municipality. Yeah, and that was the two? Um, Stood much. up to it? Well, they all agreed, to be fair. I think the the other five just... Well, I mean, the reason the two yes. was because of that. Okay. Yes. Exactly, yeah. I know. But, but even the five who supported it expressed, yes. shared that, that frustration, right. so. All right, very good. Any public hearing? Oh, that's right, thank you. It's a public hearing. If there's anybody here that would like to speak to ordinance number 23-22, please step forward, state your name and address. The voice of reason, Seeing... don't go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no one, public comment is closed. And to Motion the... to approve. There you go. I, I, I just have one comment. Okay, so, um, I'm sorry, Commissioner yep, Go right ahead. It's all right. One, just, uh, preemption rears its ugly head again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, okay. So call the roll. It was easy. Miss mm -hmm. <laughs> Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. All right, Ordinance 25 22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 101 Parks, Beaches, and Recreation of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Delray Beach, Section 101.36, Additional Rules Applying to Parks, Recreational Facilities, and the Municipal Beach by amending Subsection H, Smoking to Prohibit Smoking, Certain Tobacco Products on the Municipal Beach and in Public Parks, Providing a Conflicts Clause and a Severability Clause, Providing an Effective Date and for other purposes this is second reading and this is also just to be in conformity or to update our ordinance with um house bill uh, 105 um, which basically released the the preemption and allowed us to regulate everything except unfiltered cigars cigars yes unfiltered absolutely cigars. there you go so this is a public hearing also anybody who is interested in there. speaking to ordinance number 25-22 please step forward seeing no one public comment is closed Motion approved. second call the roll please Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Why cigars? Yes. <laughs> I would. <laughs> they cut a deal, that's why. That's exactly exactly. What it is. Okay. You know, I, I, looked, I looked into that, and they said this was the reasoning. The rich cigar history of our state. No, that was the, that was the quote that was. I think given. that they're forgetting it. Yeah, it's yeah. not us. Um, and I just wanted to add. That would be the the country to the south of us. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Cuba. I, yeah. Um, I just wanted to note that I look forward to any you know plans that staff has in regards to signage. And obviously, we're not. I mean, enforcement is. I don't want to waste too much you know energy on that. But you know, we should have a sign, plan for signage certainly. Yes, sir. I'll have an update to you, you ladies and gentlemen, in the next couple of yeah, few no weeks. Rush. Of course. Thank you. And uh, now we are in first reads. We have two of them. Ordinance number 29-22 as a first. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending Chapter 32, okay. Departments, Boards, and Commissions of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, by amending Section 32.15. Definitions to revise the definitions of city board and, and member and to create a new definition for inadequate attendance by amending section 32.17, removal 
of city board members to clarify the bases for removal of city board members by amending section 32.18 procedure to clarify the procedure for removal of a city board member, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date, and for other purposes. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boylston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. And finally, ordinance number 31-22, also first read. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, repealing Chapter 133, Offenses Against Persons, Section 133.02, Prohibition of Conversion Therapy on Minors, providing that each and every other section and subsection of Chapter 133 shall remain in full force and effect as previously adopted, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, and authority to codify, providing an effective date and for other purposes. This is consistent with the uh, City of Boca Raton federal court opinion that finds conversion therapy bans unconstitutional and a restriction on freedom of speech. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. All right, we're on to comments and inquiries. We really blew through that last section, which was Woo. great, uh, very quickly. Um, city manager? Nothing further at this time. Thank city you. City attorney? Just two quick things. Um, the first, with the conversion therapy, um, the next time you see it, it will be the second reading. I was also going to bring a resolution just acknowledging um, the city's uh, belief, opinion that it, it should be prohibited, but obviously we can't. Is that something you want me to bring forward, or do you just want to repeal it? I think you can bring that forward. Just, it's just offering yeah. support, essentially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. good. I just want to make sure. And the other matter I have before you is I believe you all received a letter yes. from the law firm Sachs Sachs Kaplan mm -hmm. concerning a quasi-judicial matter that you heard last week, um, Delray Central. Central. I always get them confused. Delray Central. It's a quasi-judicial matter. A gentleman came up and spoke. He represented himself as the president of the HOA. Um, the HOA actually wrote to all of you and indicated that he is in fact not the president of the HOA and basically had no authority to make those representations. And so I wanted to bring it to your attention if it's something that you, that, that may have affected your vote and you feel that um, you wanna reconsider it, I'm bringing it up because today would be the time limits for reconsideration. Just for your own memory, um, we did send it back to um, the lower board. Um, to ask them to make tweaks to it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not a final project, but if it is something that you felt maybe his representations that the community, I think he said that the community was in favor of this. If it was something that factored into whoever was on the prevailing side, I think it was um, Commissioner Boylston, Commissioner Johnson, and Vice Mayor Frankel. If it affected you, today would be the day where, you know, if you wanted to have reconsideration, you could bring that up right now. Yeah, I knew better. <laughs> I didn't know better because I take someone at their word. If you stand up and say something and then you mis misrepresent. Um, I'm always concerned about what the homeowners feel who are gonna be affected. So that, I still probably would have wanted to send it back because there are other problems, so. But Understood. I hope there's some action that can be taken. I don't know. Uh, actually, um, I haven't watched the video yet, but I believe he indicated that he was sworn. He absolutely did. I asked him yeah. if he was sworn, and he said he was. And um, these are our proceedings are considered official proceedings. So I know Commissioner Vice Mayor Frankel knows this um, that perjury in an official proceeding is a felony. Um, I emailed Mr. Moore. Uh, I believe either based on your direction or Mr. Moore, uh, Mr. Moore's direction, I believe the PD can look into it if, if it's warranted. Uh, I would absolutely support it because that's just wrecking it. That's, that's um, it's disruption to that is Yeah, exactly. Yes, sir. Yes, so that was the direction. Mm -hmm. Ms. Jelen and I touched base as she's outlined and we're prepared accordingly. However, I thought it was appropriate to secure you all's consensus absolutely. accordingly as well. So with that, we'll proceed and go from there. You'll, you'll, you said you haven't reviewed it yet, though. You're going to go back and just... Well, PD will. Their PD will investigate it. Um, they will determine if, in fact, uh, the elements of perjury are met, and if it's appropriate, they would forward it to the state attorney's office for a final uh, decision. Okay. I think that there was uh, two mentions of two boards. One, he was chairman of the board. One, he was the president of the association. That should, the second one should also be noticed, noticed as well to see if that was even truthful. Understood. And that's it. Wow. Okay. Um, all right, to the commission. 
can start. That's a lesson. Don't fib to the commission under. Well, I mean, you know, I let me totally you, agree. I'm in support. When you're when you're doing a quasi judicial hearing I, like that and you're I, being sworn in, I'm sorry. It's, I it's agree. not something you come I, in and start saying things that are not true. I can't disagree with you at all. It's shocking. Um, I have no comments. I was going to say thank you. <laughs> have a lovely evening, everybody who stayed. Thank you. That wasn't required. <laughs> Kidding. No comments. Okay. Thank you. First in Commissioner. The uh, yep, yep, I'll jump in. Um, you know, and since we are going to be speaking about the budget on Monday, and uh, because of Deputy Vice Mayor's um, recommendation for the award, I just want you guys to think about Parks and Rec and everything that has been put on them on the last few, you know, few few years. Um, they're already the, you know, one of the largest, most diverse departments. I mean, you know, you spend a day with Sam and go, I mean, from marinas to beaches mm -hmm. to parks, community spaces to medians to community centers, like the list goes on and on. Um, but when the DBMC went away, they also got 100 for Christmas tree in July 4th. And when St. Patrick's Day Parade went from not, you know, possibly not existing, that was tossed on them. Then COVID hit, now they're handing out food, like you, you, you mentioned. Now old school square. And this is, most of all of this has happened, why Sam, like the second, is he here? To, yes, he is. Oh, of course. Mr. Meetot came into leadership. It's been every year another very, very large responsibility. So when we're looking at the budget and we're looking at the request from Parks and Rec, I think, you know, it's something to really consider as you're going through there, how much has been piled on this department um, that already has a lot to take care of. Um, and is very, very forward-facing mm -hmm. to the residents. We, we interact with the Parks and Rec every single day or something that they manage. Um, I, I, I absolutely agree with the comment in regards to election signs. More people that vote, the better it is for, for our city, especially if we are going to put a geo bond um, on, on, the next, um, on the next ballot. Um, so I'd be very supportive of that, any type of communication. So I'm, I wasn't even uh, familiar with what happened, what's going on. Um, I know that there was some question as to where we can put signs and you can't put them in front of, uh, you know, we've always had signs out front there, so I'm always. not sure. What changed? I think it was two separate things. I think it was one, there were signs being picked up that are, you know, candidate signs. That was mm -hmm. one thing. And then two, she was saying that some people don't even know can see it. I've seen, we have, pre I've seen signs that say yeah. early polling locations. Um, Did you see any on, outside? Yeah. Did you see yeah. any yeah. outside? So, but any, anything additional that the city can do is. is yeah. Did you see perfect. any outside? Yeah, it's a big, yeah. huge banner. Yeah, yeah it's a, a flag. Yeah, I saw it. Not, yeah. not a, if you recall. Campaign signs, mm -hmm. which normally traditionally goes along with a polling location. Yes. Yeah. And flag or no flag, that's your, I'm driving straight ahead. I'm not looking to my left. I'm trying to maybe whatever's over there. It, there was a lot of confusion. Traditionally, we have had signs always. always, but all of a sudden they're being pulled up and piled. Well, they have to be a certain uh, distance from the front door or, so, or something and like that. And they already other, were marked. Exactly, but mm -hmm. otherwise we have always uh, allowed that to happen. I, I don't know what has changed. I can't figure it out either and I can't needs, get a straight I, answer okay. one thing we used to do also we had you know the construction signs the big flashing mm -hmm. signs we would have election day you know that's great that's true too remember, right i think it was when it was at the the library the voting site mm -hmm. i don't know if it was at the community center yeah i remember on, on a west atlantic avenue the, remember they had the construction sign that says voting yes. and, and i've seen those in other cities that's really we good. pull them yeah. around pull it yeah. and yeah. leave it I, I think it might have been just a miscommunication our wonderful code enforcement Officers have just been habitually trained. If you see a sign, you don't. It's in the wrong place in their yeah. in their yeah. normal uh, workaday world. You pull it up, yeah. and I don't know exactly what happened, but okay. Well, I'm going to let Mr. Moore. Did you want to say something about this? I would because, of course, there was a brief dialogue about this last week, and I've talked to one or two of you all since last week, and of course, I touched base with Director of Neighborhood and Community Services, Mr. Semi Waldauer. Relative to direction, we even consulted with the Office of the City Attorney as well regarding standards and a pamphlet distribution regarding sign requirements, et cetera. So I see this evening's follow-up dialogue as an opportunity for us to all be on the same page in terms of what the requirements are, number one. Number two, what your expectations may or may not be. So Mr. Walthour, if you can please come forward, please, and to help 
accept the direction being outlined, but to also our take. Mr. Moore, we, uh, we don't need an explanation, I don't think. I mean, we're okay. tired. We've been yeah. here just, for like we, six hours. Fair enough. We just, just, just need the just, signs to just, stay where yeah. they're posted. If you can, just make sure that it, if, if, it's, we're, the if it's the proper distance, we should have allowed The proper it. distance for in front weeks. of municipal for facilities up between now and August Correct. 23rd. And, and in general in that area. So like, you know, not in front of, you know, City Hall and, you know, all these other, well, just, just where you're having that, you know. Right. Yeah. So not in front of City Hall, Community Center, those locations. I think we're good. Yes, Can you say in front of City Hall? Well, you know what I'm saying, not As they're coming in, in, it was at the corner. It was not yes. where the mailbox is. Understood. And they were pulled up and, and disposed of. Understood. Okay. And just so. the, the last thing I have, something that I know we're all super excited about, and we're getting a lot of questions about it, um, just for staff to clarify the general timeline of the Atlantic Historic overlay that that is not going to be on an agenda in in the near future and then what the process that that takes to even get there you don't have to go into detail but i just wanted to be on the record that this isn't something that's going to happen tomorrow correct i mean i i'm sure we're at least a year is that oh fair boy. okay okay Six to nine months. And there are, re and there are obviously reasons, right? There's yes. obviously a lot of reasons for You're that. You're dealing with people's okay. property rights. Right. You, know, you have yes. to be methodical. No, we understand. We understand. Time. Yeah. Nobody's yeah. rushing into this. Yeah. Okay. She's not this thing. We're good. Okay. We're good. Yeah, we're good. Nope. Okay. <laughs> There's public hearings, HPD. We're good. I just got yeah. scolded for attempting sanity. Yeah, so we're, I'm out. sorry. We're just at the end. I know. We're at the That's end. It. You're right. I know. Okay. I know. So, okay. Anything else? That's it. That's okay, go ahead, Commissioner Johnson. I had some, but you know. I'm, I'm, I, I'd like to be brief, but I don't know if, if you agree with me, we'll be, we'll be brief. Uh, in my travels around the city recently and uh, having the occasion to speak with our code enforcement, especially about the signs, I was asking other questions because I haven't had an opportunity to uh, converse with them. Um, the common theme arose that we have um, no teeth in our codes anymore. They can write all the code they want, but the methodology that we have used, I believe the city has outgrown. So I'd like to get consensus, consensus tonight to utilize a special magistrate for all code matters, not just those related to life, health, and safety violations as we currently do. The, okay, go ahead. The, I won't be much longer, I promise, I'll read fast. The magistrate has been used by the city for over three years and has provided uniform, consistent decisions on these legal matters that they've had brought before them. Our policies support the use of the magistrate for all code matters. Therefore, I would ask consensus to move solely to a magistrate system instead of a board. Granted, this would probably be discussed, but the positions for a ch it, I'm advocating a change. Mm -hmm. The city has grown and sh so should our processes. So we actually had this actually come up before, I think. And what was the outcome and why did we not go in that direction? Um, we have a hybrid system, so we, we came to a middle ground. Right. Um, we do use a special magistrate for life, health, safety, um, repeat violations, things like that. Um, and, and we use a code board for all other matters. Um, you know, code is very legal, mm -hmm. and you know the magistrate is is an attorney. Um, he uh, he can handle much longer hearings because it's one person, mm -hmm. so it, it, it's easier. You know, my you know if you want my preference, the preference is the magistrate. Most municipalities use so a magistrate. Go away from the code board. So you you would essentially do away with the code board and have the magistrate coming in twice a month, essentially, mm -hmm. and just handle hearing the cases. Um, you know, and so that would be your recommendation. It is, and I, and this is no disrespect to the code board. They do an amazing job, but I really believe, you know, the, the magistrate. It's just a much faster system, and you get a lot more uniformity. I think. Okay. Well, I support. Well, I support it being on a future agenda. I don't think we can actually make that decision in comments, right? Well, I'd have to go through. I would, yeah. So it would yeah, require yeah. a change to the code. Yeah. yeah. And so, Absolutely. yeah. I'm so get ready for a lot of talk about it because I have a feeling we're going to have a big show out, uh, show up. So it, just be ready for it. That's all. Anything else, Commissioner? No, Mayor. Thank you okay, very much. I am. I'm done. So Good meeting night. adjourned. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Oh, no, right. <laughs> I'm not even going to say a word. Thank you.
I know, me too. I don't think we do. We won't take long.